ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. It's Wednesday, May 15, 2024, and I'm calling to order night seven of Arlington's 2024 annual town meeting. Can everyone hear me okay? No? Can, can we get the, the volume up a little bit? Is that better? Okay. Uh, we have 18 articles left, two of which are no action without substitute, so let's get to work. Please rise for the national anthem. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mr. DeCourcy? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Steve DeCourcy, Chair of the Select Board. It is moved in the unlikely event that if all the business of the meeting as set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Monday, May 20th, 2024 at 8 p.m. We have a second. All those in favor of um, that will reconvene Monday uh, at 8 p.m. If we don't finish tonight, say, ye say yes. yes. All those opposed, say no. no. We're gonna, we'll reconvene. Or you can finish tonight. You have those two options. Okay, let's take a, a test vote now. A couple minutes. Um, Yes, yeah, so why don't we skip ahead to uh, announcements and resolutions. Any announcements and resolutions tonight? Yes, front row. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. JP Lewicki, Precinct 2. Uh, I just wanted to inform you all that we're starting a new group called Extend the Red Line, uh, focusing on a couple different things, on, uh, both on advocating for an initial feasibility study for extending the red line through Arlington, and on... Uh, advocating for better, better bus, tran uh, bus and transit service. Uh, I've got some flyers up in the back uh, on the table over there, or feel free to talk to me during the break. Uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you. And now I, need, I know who to speak to about putting attribution on handouts that are put in the back of the room. Thank you, thank you. Uh, any other announcements or resolutions? Yeah, Mr. Sinesha. Rajiv Soneja, Precinct 2. Uh, just an announcement to acknowledge uh, Nagpa Day today. Nagpa commonly refers to as what is known as, in English, as the Arab-Israeli War of 1947, which ended with Israel declaring its statehood on May 14, 1948, after which this is recognized by Arabs as Nagpa Day. Um, the UN counts six million Palestinian refugees. Nearly 80% of Palestinian land was taken over by Israel in the conflict in 1947 to 49 alone. Um, this has a great impact of people of Palestinian origin, so I just wanted to come here and acknowledge that today. Thank you. Thank you. Any other announcements or resolutions? Yeah, front row. Hi, Stephanie Ford, Precinct 8. I have an announcement for the Housing Corporation of Arlington Walk. Do we have one slide for me? Did it I, make I it believe, in? Uh, Do we have a slide up for the Housing Corporation of Arlington? Very green. Thank you. Uh, I should be very short below my minutes. I think I have three things to say. One is 
Uh, Housing Corporation of Arlington is a very interesting organization who purchases property, who develops property, and rents them as affordable housing. We have a QR code, a couple of QR codes there. We have a flyer in the back that lets you have more information about how that works. They provide services for housing, to direct people to Arlington Eats for different things that people need. And they're having a walk this weekend. My three is gonna turn into a four, I apologize. They're having a walk this weekend, Sunday, May 19th, starting at the Jason Russell House this year. Please join us to walk, to have a great time, to join the band, to have great food, and to bring awareness to affordable housing. And the fourth that sort of came out of nowhere, I apologize, is they just installed, do we have a picture up there? There's a rendering on the top right there of a very exciting ADU that Housing Corporation of Arlington had built by a local robotic automated housing construction company that we're very excited about. This has been delivered to Dorothy. Dorothy Road, I believe. Her name is Dorothy. And she'll be finished soon with a ribbon cutting and grand opening. Stay tuned, but you can learn more here. So, thank you. Thank you. Any other announcements or resolutions tonight? <laughs> Seeing none. Uh, are we ready for a test vote now? Yes. Let's take that. And the test question is, true or false, Memorial Day was first observed after World War I. I believe that's true. Press one for true or two for false or three to abstain. This coming Monday is not Memorial Day. I believe it's the following Monday. But. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion fails, which is correct. Let's cycle through the screens now. I believe it was first observed in 1868 after the Civil War. Okay, and while those screens are cycling, are there any reports of committees? We have one here. Uh, Ms. Deschler first. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. I move that Article 3 be taken from the table. We have a second. All those in favor of removing Article 3 from the table say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. Article 3 is removed from the table. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jim Ballon, Precinct 6, and also a member of Zero Waste Arlington Committee. I move that the report of the Zero Waste Arlington Committee is received. We have a second. All those in favor of receiving the report of the Zero Waste Arlington Committee say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. It is unanimous. Um, Thank you. Zero Waste Arlington is a 10-person town committee which um, seeks to reduce Arlington's waste stream to protect public health and our environment. In keeping with our mission, we have not provided copies of our report um, <laughs> because we don't want to waste paper, um, but they are available on the town um, meeting web page, and we encourage you to read it. It's only five pages, and it's very informative about the activities we have accomplished this past year. I want to just very quickly go through um, a summary of some of the highlights of our year. Next slide, please. So single-use waste reduced at Town Day. Um, we provided free, delicious Quabbin Reservoir drinking water from the MWRA truck um, for all Town Day attendees. And we also launched a reusable takeout container pilot program with several participating food vendors. And you can see the photo there of um, what that container looks like. These programs reduced waste at Town Day, um, over 500 single-use water bottles, uh, over 100 single-use takeout containers, and we gathered a barrel of compost that avoided the waste stream. Uh, we hope to expand these efforts in future Town Days and work towards a zero waste event. Next slide, please. As part of our commitment to the community when we um, introduced the single-use plastic water bottle ban, we launched Arlington on Tap uh, with the goal of advocating, planning, and implementing water bottle filling stations around town. 
Um, there are water bottle filling stations now at the recently renovated Herd Field, as well as um, the newest one at Thorndike, uh, which is right next to the Welcome to Arlington sign. Um, coming soon in 2024, a new unit at the Arlington Reservoir, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, um, and Robbins Farm Park when that renovation um, uh, it gets further along in the fall. Um, so please bring your own reusable water bottles when you go out in town, um, so then you can avoid having to purchase any plastic bottles. Uh, special thanks to Jim Feeney, Joe Connolly, Mike Rademacher uh, for their collaboration on our Arlington on Tap efforts. Uh, we have an interactive Google map on our website which shows uh, um, all available uh, drink, public drinking water in Arlington, and we'll update that with new sites when they come along. Next slide. Our legislative subcommittee has been very active tracking and advocating for waste and recycling related legislation at the State House. Um, member, we are a member of the Plastic Free Coalition to promote state legislation. Um, we are advocating for statewide bills on producer responsibility to shift waste disposal costs to manufacturers rather than cities and towns and for the expansion of the state bottle bill. Um, and we have uh, appreciate the support last year of town meeting for our resolution um, that was in Article 64. Next slide, please. Um, we continue our outreach and education efforts. We visited nearly all of the Arlington restaurants and partnered with many to reduce single-use plastics. Um, this includes promoting Skip the Stuff, which is a national campaign to reduce single-use plastics. Um, there's a composting pilot that Town Meeting approved funding for last year that we are helping to implement. Um, website traffic has increased. Um, our membership is increasing. And now I'm gonna speed up. Um, household waste uh, reduction. The textile diversion from the uh, waste stream has made a significant contribution to lowering our waste um, in addition to earning the public schools some significant money. Um, and we help with the very popular swap shed and the recycling center where you can um, recycle many hard to, hard to recycle items that you can't put out on the curb. Next slide. Um, solid waste, how are we doing? Um, our efforts and your efforts are paying off. There's, the numbers are going down. Um, and you can see in the numbers at the right, um, we have actually already met our 2030 goal for um, waste reduction, which is fantastic. Uh, we're now working towards an 80% reduction from 2008 levels by our 2050 goal. Lastly, I just want to acknowledge the amazing members of Zero Waste Arlington who have been hardworking and dedicated throughout the year. Uh, they include Margie Bell, Jennifer Campbell, Emily Dirtz, Paul Goldberg, Sarah Metz, Scott Mullen, Amy Spear, Priya Sankalia, Larry Slotnick, and of course we do this in coordination with Arlington's fantastic recycling coordinator, Charlotte Milan. And last slide, sorry to go over, um, yeah, here's how to reach us. Thank important. you. Thank you. Do we have, uh, any other reports of committees? Ms. Deschel? Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. I move that the second supplement to the report of the Finance Committee be received. Okay, we have a second on receiving the, the, the second supplemental report of the Finance Committee. All those in favor say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. It is unanimous. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I was before you just two nights ago explaining um, that the Finance Committee meets before town meeting and why, and this is a perfect example of why we meet. Uh, literally right before Monday's meeting started, the deputy manager and I were informed that the ACMI's cable revenue projections were off, um, and so we needed probably to take a revote. Uh, we spent yesterday working with ACMI, figuring out the, 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 the new numbers, um, and we worked out a draft uh, new vote that the Finance Committee uh, was uh, talked about and voted on tonight, and that is what is contained in this report, and it relates only to Article 35. Thank you. Any other reports of committees? Seeing none, Ms. Deschler? I move that Article 3 be laid upon the table. Okay, we have a motion to lay Article 3 upon the table and a second. All those in favor say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. It is unanimous. That takes us to Article 32, which is a recommended vote uh, from the Redevelopment Board of no action. We have no substitute motion. It was held from the consent agenda by Mr. Hupp. Um, 
I've been in touch with Mr. Hupp, and uh, he's decided to not move forward with a substitute motion or other motions uh, that would resurrect this, uh, this article. So, um, uh, so we will just go straight to a, uh, a vote on Article 32. Uh, Mr. Cunningham, do we, do we need an electronic vote? Because this is a two-thirds vote, but it is no action recommended. We do, okay. So we'll go straight to a two-thirds electronic vote on Article 32's main motion of no action. Okay, voting is now open. If you're in favor of taking no action on Article 32, press one for yes. If you don't want to take any action, but we'll take no action anyway, press two, and press three to abstain. Five seconds left to vote. Let's close voting. And the motion passes, 171 in the affirmative, five in the negative, four abstentions, we will take no action. All right, one sec. And that takes us to Article 33. I believe Mr. Revlak, you're gonna lead us off uh, since Ms. Zemberry is not present tonight. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve Revelak, Arlington Redevelopment Board. Article 33 is a proposed zoning bylaw amendment related to altering the rear yard setbacks in business districts. It was inserted by Andrew Greenspan. So the board supports this article, noting that the smaller setback on lower stories may provide for more commercial space and mixed use developments, which may make them more economically feasible to build because upper stories will still be subject to the larger setback distance, this change will not be detrimental to residential properties abutting commercial and mixed use properties. The redevelopment board had voted 5-0 at our April 1st meeting to recommend favorable action on Article 32. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. So at this point, I'd like to uh, invite up uh, Mr. Greenspawn to speak since uh, he was the petitioner here. Before he speaks, uh, let's switch over to the speaker queue and clear that so everyone knows when uh, uh, so everyone has the same timing on when they can uh, request to speak. Can we just show that quickly and reset? Okay, speaker queue is now open. Uh, Mr. Greenspawn? I should have a slide deck. Yeah, oh, uh, can we switch over to the slide deck, please? We have a point of order. What is the correct speaker queue? Was it cleared more than once? Okay, can we show the speaker queue? Was it cleared multiple times? Okay. We're gonna clear it one more time and just one more time. Okay. It's now open. Okay. And we'll switch back to the slides. Someday we'll be able to show both at the same time and it'll be amazing. Um, okay. Mr. Greenspawn, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Good evening, everyone. My name is Andy Greenspawn, 89 Palmer Street, Precinct 5, town meeting member. I'm going to present on this citizen's petition article I submitted concerning rear yard setbacks in business districts. Uh, next slide. Um, here's just the overall warrant language as you're all familiar with. Next slide. Um, this is an adjustment to what town meeting approved in the special town meeting um, in October 2023, Article 6, where we changed the rear yard setbacks in the business districts from complex formulas such as, I think, height over width divided by six and such like that, and replaced it with fixed distances based on what the abutting rear property is. Um, that's this overall that you can see here. Um, next slide. But to zoom in just on the specific change I'm dealing with here, it's for when the rear yard setback of the business district abuts residential. Um, so the only thing I'm adjusting is as listed here, in particular, replacing 30 feet for four or, and more stories when abutting a residential district with, for buildings of four or more stories, 20 feet for the first three stories and 30 feet for the fourth and higher story when abutting a residential district. Next slide. This is simpler to visualize uh, with a basic diagram. This is the existing zoning. Uh, this should be to scale based on the average heights and setbacks for each of these districts. Um, the right side is the business district, which typically fronts Mass Ave or Broadway, though there are a few other places such as Summer Street. The residential on the left is typically a side street. 
Under current zoning, if you go from a three to four story building in the business district, the entire building has to be shifted back an additional 10 foot setback in order to build it, or for example, adjust an existing building. Uh, next slide. Uh, my amendment, oh, sorry. Um, under my amendment, very basically, the first three stories would remain at that 20 foot setback, and any fourth and higher story would have a 30 foot setback as is in the current zoning. Uh, next slide. Here's a basic example of how this would work in practice, assuming sort of an average business lot, though Arlington lots are fairly irregular. Assuming the width of the building could be 60 feet and the depth could be 80 feet, allowing for the 20 foot rear yard setback. For three stories, this yields 14,400 uh, square feet. Under, um, uh, next slide. Under current zoning, if you had wanted to build a fourth story or build a four story building instead of the three story building, the entire depth of the building has to be shrunk an extra 10 feet in depth. So you only get a net increase in 2200 square feet for the added floor. And that doesn't even take into account mechanicals that you might need um, an elevator. So there'd be even less space for business, et cetera. Um, next slide. Um, if the proposed amendment takes effect, the uh, building would get 4,200 square feet extra for the next floor, so you're approximately doubling the additional square footage available for development in the business district. Next slide. There are several reasons I've proposed this amendment. One is economics, um, requiring a 20-foot setback to become a 30-foot setback for all stories of a building that goes from three to four stories decreases economic feasibility of construction. Um, Additionally, a larger first floor setback would be more attractive for commercial space users, encouraging developers to build such spaces. We've heard many times over the past couple of years that there are businesses that want to be in Arlington, but there's no spaces that, for them that satisfy the requirements they need. Um, a space with more depth allows for more customization of uses. Um, and last, if this increase if this increases the size and therefore the appraised value of commercial spaces, it increases the commercial tax base. And we've had a lot of conversation about the lack of tax pace from new growth in summer, uh, Arlington. Next slide. Um, considering other parts of the zoning code, there's separate other zoning language that caps story and height limits for business districts already. So if the, this, if the current zoning as such with the rear yard setback um, may effectively cap certain parcels at three stories because it wouldn't be economically, fe um, financially feasible to build four stories and shrink that setback even if there's a higher story limit on that parcel. Um, so that doesn't seem sort of fair and consi consistent with the separate parts of the zoning code. Um, uh, next slide. In terms of shade considerations, this change shouldn't impact uh, shade on rear, rear uh, adjacent parcels due to the fourth and higher stories because in the existing zoning, if you're building four or more stories, everything has to be set back 30 feet. Um, if you're building up to three stories, everything is set back 20 feet. This amendment is sort of splitting the difference, so the shading should be the same uh, regardless compared to existing zoning. Next slide. Um, my last point is just to compare this proposal to an adjacent community. I'm not saying Arlington is at all similar to Somerville. They both have very different distributions and intersections of residential and commercial parcels, but their, Somerville's code is the best overhauled zo form zoning code I could find to make a comparison, since many of our adjacent communities still use that complicated mathematical formula to sort of figure out setbacks that is not particularly useful. Um, in the Somerville form zoning code here, mid-rise buildings are analogous to business districts and neighborhood residential here is similar to our R0, R1, and R2 districts in Arlington. And you can see here for rear yard setbacks for mid-rise when it abuts residential, the first three stories have a 20 foot setback and higher stories have a 30 foot setback. So just as sort of a point of comparison that's not necessarily precise but helpful. Uh, next slide. And uh, that's it. Happy to answer questions in the speaker queue. Great, thank you. Um, so let's switch over to the speaker queue so everyone can see what I'm doing here. Um, there's a lot of names here that, that uh, speakers that we've, we've heard from uh, in recent days, so I'm actually gonna jump down a little bit to, uh, we'll take Ms. DeRocher first, and then Ms. Cullinane, and there may be a couple others, and then I'll circle back to the top. Michelle DeRocher, Precinct 19. Um, I just had a question about the rationale for the current 30, foot setback for the four and more stories. But, but the part that's being stricken 
Yes, from, exactly. From the, the zoning bylaw. Yeah. So, um, what, what's your question? Clearly, there was a, an interest in having a difference between the three or fewer stories and the four or more stories. So, I would like to know what the original rationale was for that. Mr. Revelock? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Steve Revelock, Arlington Redevelopment Board. Uh, so the rationale was basically to, you know, to f when a taller building abuts a residential property, to move it away a little bit. Um, you know, and it's basically moving back the, basically to move back the higher part. Uh, we use 30 feet, um, you know, to be honest, I, you know, speaking for myself and not the redevelopment board as a whole, I think Mr. Greenspun's suggestion makes a lot of sense and I wish we had done it then. Um, but, basi but basically it's, you know, to prover uh, provide some light lines. So for a business building uh, um, with that scale, was there no consideration that more space would be needed behind it for things like dumpsters or parking or any detritus from the, the building operations that now will be closer to the home? So for, in terms of the, the detritus that you mentioned, <laughs> dumpsters and, and so forth, um, I suspect that would be present if, if the building were only three stories tall. Because typically in mixed use buildings, the commercial uses on the bottom floor, sometimes you know, maybe portion of the second, second floor. But you know that part uh, is I don't see that as being likely to change. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We'll take uh, I believe I said Ms. Kulinane next, and then after that, um, Ms. Evans. Which I'll just point out that those I believe are the three female speakers in the entire list that we hear less from, and so you can draw your own conclusions from that. Hi, Joanne Cullinane, Precinct 21. Um, I just have some questions. Um, there's a lot of, um, I guess, data that I would like to have had, like in order to um, fully consider the implications of this beyond like shade studies, um, which are valid too. But uh, how many parcels are there in the included B zones? Uh, Mr. Revlock, do you have an answer? Offhand, I believe we have approximately 360 B district parcels. I'm looking at Director Ricker, she's nodding her head, so that's, that's a rough number. Okay, and these are separate from the MBTA overlay zone? Correct, right. there is no intersection in between the business districts and the MBTA overlay district. Okay. They are completely separate. Do you know how many are now 20 foot from the rear lot line that could now be developed up five stories uh, at that as they are, and how many are 30 feet from the rear lot line and would actually maybe gain more commercial on the first floor? That I, so most of the buildings we, in a lot of our commercial districts, many of the buildings are at non-conforming setbacks. Um, I live in East Arlington, that's the one I'm mo most familiar with. And you know, in those cases, there are narrow lots and you know, even imposing a 20 foot setback would be, make it difficult to redevelop. Of course, there are also larger parcels like Everyone, what seems to be the favorite, the Walgreens parking lot uh, down on down on Mass Ave. There, you know, there's they had they would someone redeveloping that parcel would have plenty of room in the rear to play with. But we don't know how many of each. Uh, no, I do not. Um, um, if building if housing is built above it, I understand where our own inclusionary bylaws would apply. But if over six units. Correct. Right, okay. There's no mandate for that, but there is the town bylaw, right? So the, the town bylaw is a mandate when Good. there are, uh, when there is construction of six or more residential units. Okay. Um, but do we know how many residents or units might be demolished to create newer, more expensive units above so, what might be redeveloped? So in, um, for the current B district parcels, most of them are single use parcels. So there's, there's generally, you know, aside from mixed use buildings, there are, you know, some pre-existing mixed use like the Capitol Theater, um, but generally, and uh, so the commercial block in Arlington Heights, but generally they are single stories. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's really a question, the question sort of asked me to predict what people will actually rebuild in future years, and that can vary a lot. 
Um, is there actually a mandate for commercial? The mandate is for mixed use. Uh, residential is only one form of use, so the, you know, the, the second use would have to be some sort of commercial use. Okay. And it's, so there's no way, we can't predict how much commercial versus residential would be built under this compared to what we have now, right? Compared to what we have, it would like, because most of the, most of the commercial parcels in town are, or a fair number of them are single story, uh, there would probably be an increase in the number of residential because the existing commercial parcels do not have that component. Mm -hmm. So we don't know the ratio, but there'd be, it's fair to say there may be more residential than commercial expansion. Yeah, you know, it's a function of height. Uh, so at three stories, you it would probably typically be one story commercial, one to one half. At a three story building, you'd typically have uh, one to one and a half stories of commercial, and the rest would be residential. Probably one story would be more common, so that would be a two to one on a basis of square footage. Uh, if you were to go for, if you were to look at uh, taller buildings, you know. We typically get ground floor commercial on the ground floor, sometimes on the second. Um, so I guess I'd like to say uh, thank you. I think that's it. I think that um, we don't know the financial implications for the town budget, and I just want to say that with the MBTA Act, um, we don't really know the pace of development and how that will proceed. So we've just done some really big rezoning, um, and I worry about the financial implications for our town budget. Um, where, and if this might exacerbate the fiscal shortfalls we face since we have a 90, 95% of our revenue comes from a residential tax base as is, and so we don't know these ratios and how that might exacerbate that. Um, this article is also presented, I understand the, the reasoning that it would be better for commercial, um, but it could exacerbate the, the fiscal situation, and I'm not sure we know how much it would help with commercial. Um, but mostly, I just feel like a lot of data uh, about the implications of the article were not included before today anywhere where I could find them. Um, and until now, I didn't really have a lot of this data. Um, and if we didn't have this data, I feel it's hard for us to consider and deliberate this uh, beforehand or discuss what it might mean with residents uh, of, our own, of our precincts. Uh, we heard from Mr. Leone on Monday that his neighbors, and he lives right off Mass Ave, were saying, what's the MBTA overlay, and is my house in it? Um, so clearly we have work to do. There wasn't a lot of good outreach and communication there. Um, and I think with this as well, I think, you know, there's, there has, there's not enough information that's been given to us that we could pass on. Uh, no, I'm just, well, okay. Um, I urge you to vote no to largely, uh, potentially largely impactful zoning changes that are not presented to town meeting with the information we need to consider and deliberate and perhaps share details with precinct residents uh, before the fact. Thank you. Okay, we'll take Ms. Evans next and then we'll go back to the top of the queue with Mr. Lewicki. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Winnell Evans, Precinct 14. Um, right now, Arlington can build five-story mixed-use buildings right up to the side setback. And with the reduction of the rear setback, this could create an enormously, the impression of an enormous mass um, for the houses who are now seeing this coming up against the rear lot lines. In addition, I think the impact needs to be considered on the, the great number of non-conforming lots in town, particularly in East Arlington, um, where on a corner um, you're going to have the, the building that fronts the main corridor may have that rear lot line uh, being the same as the side lot line for the house next to it that faces out onto the side street. Many of these houses already have non-conforming setbacks. They are very close to their some instances where they are actually on the side lot line and they are now going to have up to five-story buildings looming over them. Um, so I likewise urge a no vote on this. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's bringing changes to the town, and as Ms. Cullinane said, we've, we've just approved a whole lot of changes, so let's, let's not overwhelm people. Thank you so much. Okay, Mr. Lewicki and then Mr. Newton. 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. JP Lewicki, Precinct 2. Um, I had a few questions. I'm not sure if they'd be better addressed to town council or more likely the redevelopment board. Okay. You could ask your question, then we can talk yeah, sure. Thank you. <laughs> um, first of all, how long has this zoning bylaw actually been in effect? And have we seen any projects developed under this current version of it? Uh, Mr. Reblack? So the current version uh, of this bylaw, the re referring to the rear yard setbacks in dis business districts, it was a voted, uh, positively voted by a special town meeting in October of 2023. The attorney general approved it, I believe, in March, and we have not seen any projects uh, under this new regime. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, actually, I have a few more, if, okay. if, if that's okay. Um, what kind of review process would mixed-use projects with four or more stories go through? Like how uh, the, many meetings do they tend to have? So this would be, uh, it is a process called environmental design review done through the redevelopment board. Uh, typically we will look at, um, you know, the, the, what the project is proposing as well as landscaping, effect on utilities, effect on water, effect on abutting properties, um, that sort of thing. Okay, and so how many meetings would they usually kind of go before the redevelopment board for? I would say two to four is typical. My colleagues are nodding, so two to four. Okay, thank you. Um, does the redevelopment board have latitude to, uh, to kind of allow this combination of a 20-foot uh, setback with a upper story set, uh, step back for, as a kind of exception for a project? So I hope I give the correct citation, but there is a provision in the zoning bylaw, I think it's 5.3.16, that gives the redevelopment board the discretion to adjust, uh, set, to adjust setbacks um, on a project-by-project -project basis owing to circumstances unique to that project. Okay, thank you. Um, is this the sort of exception that the redevelopment board would be like, likely to allow in if it kind of matches the site and is appropriate? I can't speculate on whether the board would likely to be allowed because it would be on a case-by-case -case basis, but I believe it is something that an applicant could reasonably, reasonably request. Thank you. Um, if the zoning bylaw uh, passes, this change uh, goes into effect, uh, could the redevelopment board impose a larger setback or uh, kind of return to the original 30-foot if the site-specific conditions made it inappropriate for to have the smaller setback? Look at my colleagues. I think it's, you know, we, we, do, have the, we do have the ability to do that, yes. Thank you. Um, and just to clarify, um, every project uh, four stories or above where this would matter uh, would require approval and to go through that review process, right? So it's actually every mixed-use project. So even a three-story mixed-use uh, project would be subject to environmental design review. Thank you. Um, that's all my questions. Thank you. Yeah. So as we've heard, uh, this is something that the redevelopment board themselves would have advocated for. It's something that they already can do and are likely to do. Uh, it's something that uh, they can undo if they need to and on a case-by-case -case basis. So for me, I kind of just view this as a change to the, the zoning bylaw to kind of properly advertise what a mixed-use developer is likely to be facing when they kind of are considering doing a project in Arlington. Uh, so I hope you'll join me in supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take Mr. Newton next and then Mr. Loretti. Good evening, Sanjay Newton, Precinct 10. Um, Lots of things already been said that I won't repeat, um, but one new piece of, or extra piece of information I wanted to add to the conversation tonight. During the MBTA communities process, both the ARB and the MBTA communities working group um, heard from the Chamber of Commerce that there are businesses that who often want to come to Arlington and they can't find the kind of modern commercial spaces that they'd like to occupy. Um, to me, this seems like exactly the kind of win-win um, that we as a town often talk about, right? We want more and better businesses um, and more and better commercial spaces, um, and we want more housing. Um, this is a, a great way to get us in, moving in that direction. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Loretti, and then uh, Mr. Wagner. 
<clears throat> Thanks, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. I had um, provided a photograph to you that I would like to have shown, but not right now. Could we go back to the proponent slides and show the one that shows the images of the buildings in his example? And I'd like to show them because I don't doesn't think he um, properly considers all the zoning restrictions in town, and therefore his example is unrealistic. Um, first of all, he talks about the um, developer only being able to add an additional story. Well, in almost all business districts, that is B2A or higher, um, and for all, almost all lots, the height limit is five stories, not four. And what he doesn't show in his figure is for the front yard, once you go uh, four stories or above, you need a seven and a half foot setback. He doesn't show that in this, so I have to assume um, either he forgot about that or there's already a seven and a half foot um, step back or set back from the property line that could be used to addi give additional floor er the additional floor area that he wants. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, it's hard to tell because he didn't specify all the conditions in his example, but um, I don't think you can blame this 30-foot um, required setback for the lack of floor area when he's not using all the available floor area that is there to begin with. Now, if he is, then the example he gives is impossible anyway because he comes up with a building that's over 18,000 square feet. And if he's building out to the setbacks, that means he's got a 6,000 square foot lot. And you can't have more than three times the building area uh, in relation to the lot area in any district for mixed use. So anyway, but let's, um, let's go on. Uh, if I could bring up, um, while I'm speaking, if you could bring up my photograph of a real mixed use development in Arlington. Uh, I think the problem with the example stems from a misconception a lot of people have in Arlington. Um, and that is that you ought to be able to build out to all of the dimensional limits in the bylaw. That's not the way zoning works. By design, you cannot maximize each of the limits like height, floor error ratio, and setbacks. In this case, what it means is you can build tall and thin, you can build short and fat, but you can't build tall and fat like the proponent wants to. So what I'm showing in this photograph is the way a real uh, mixed-use development works in Arlington. This is building is currently under construction of 80 Broadway, former um, monogamy beer and wine. And what, if you look, there is, um, well, let me step back. If you look, there's a small fifth floor on this building. Now, the proponent was worried that, in his case, the developer wouldn't find it economical to build a fifth floor with 2,200 square feet. Well, in this case, the developer put a fifth floor on um, and is just getting about 1,600 square feet of space. So clearly, it is economical. And the proponent also doesn't mention when you shrink the, uh, or when you, when you maintain a smaller footprint and build up, you're not building as large a larger foundation, so you're saving money in that respect. You've got a foundation. It's called the floor of the building below you. Um, now, um, one of the things that I think is interesting about this, and, and um, a previous speaker alluded to, is the, the owner of that two-family house to the right is actually very lucky because the developer could have built right up to the property line. And in Arlington, they could have built right up to that property line and built 60 feet high because that's what our zoning bylaw allows. What's happened in this case is the redevelopment board made a mistake when they tried to copy Somerville's zoning bylaw for the rear yard setback, and they didn't do it correctly. And that's what the proponent is, is aiming to fix. I think Arlington, if they want to adopt Somerville zoning, they need to adopt the Somerville side yard setbacks as well, because what they would require is a minimum of 10 feet setback for the side yard, and then once you get above the fourth, the fourth floor and above, it goes up to 30 feet, just like the, the rear yard setback. Um, you know, this, this again is really an issue of the massing of the building, and I, I suggest that all of these things need to be taken into consideration. And as was um, also mentioned by a previous speaker, the redevelopment board has the ability to adjust these setbacks if it's really necessary. So I'll be voting no on this amendment and ask you to do the same. And I'm certainly be prepared to consider it once the ARB also looks into the side yard setbacks that are, are required in, in Somerville and offers Arlington residents the same degree of protection that the city of Somerville does. Thank you.
Thank you. We'll take Mr. Wagner and then uh, Mr. Weinstein. And uh, this is not a comment on the previous speakers. Just a reminder, we're several speakers into this uh, debate now. So uh, going forward, let's try not to uh, repeat any comments. And again, that's not a comment on the previous speakers. Mr. Wagner, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Could I have the past image put up again? Carl Wagner, Precinct 15, please. Mr. Loretti's image? Yes, please. Yep. Um, I just wanted to point out that that former Monotomy Beer and Wine building that is now a, a five-story building is a mixed-use building in the business district. If we wanted to help our businesses, the best way would be to reform our mixed-use law so that business goes in instead of residential masquerading as business, which is what's going on there. But what I really wanted to ask you about 255 people is have we done adequate work to make sure that 300 or several hundred properties that abut these what would be very large and now even closer and very large buildings uh, 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 to be, have we, have we told them that this is coming? I don't think there's been adequate notification of the many thousands of people that we 250 represent. And it was said, I believe, just a few speakers ago that um, since the law abruptly changed in October of last year, we haven't had buildings put in. I think we need to wait and watch the effect of the changes before we loosen them up and bring massive structures 33% closer to the properties that abut these business district mixed use things or possible businesses. So I would ask you to wait a while in these business districts before we take the citizen initiative of, uh, of bringing the buildings closer because uh, a five-story building, even if you're 30 feet away from it on the back, is gonna be very big. Remember, no, no side uh, restrictions or zero or 10 feet. Uh, lastly, I'd like to ask, did the proponent himself propose this because he lives abutting a building like this or is the proponent giving us recipes for other people's structures. Is that a question for Mr. Greenspawn, the petitioner? Are you asking about his personal circumstances? Okay, well, we don't know if the proponent is, is abutting, but I would imagine that if you were abutting or I were abutting, this would be a huge loss of property. Mr. Moderator, my point is that by allowing the buildings to come 33% closer on the back, we have a loss of the quality of life of the renters, the leasers, or the owners of the residential properties, and we haven't even seen how bad it will be with the uh, more restrictive uh, settings. So I ask us to go a few years and see how it will be. Thank you very much. Okay. I'll take Mr. Weinstein and then Mr. Rudick. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, can you all hear me? Is this all right? Um, I'd actually just like to put, to run this uh, proposal. So just uh, name and precinct then. Excuse me? Uh, name and precinct. Oh, uh, Jordan Weinstein, precinct 21. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to run it through uh, our own, you know, experts basically from our own uh, committees. So uh, I'd like to ask of the conservation committee, I, I don't see David White here, but is somebody else from the ConCon? Is there anyone here who could answer a question? Mr. White, David? I'm sorry, what? M Mr. White, I believe Mr. White from the uh, Conservation Commission is here, but, but, but he has no comment. Oh, no comment. Okay, the, the question I wanna ask, and uh, anybody can volunteer, maybe the ARB, uh, maybe uh, Eugene Benson could come up and uh, answer. Well, you can ask the question first and- The we'll... question is, um, <laughs> would this lead to a loss of open space? Would anyone from the Redevelopment Board uh, care to respond? So the requirements for open space in a business district are, um, I forgot the exact number, it is a percentage of the lot area. It's irrespective of the, um, irrespective of the gross floor area, which was, you know, this was adopted uh, last fall. But basically that's an independent requirement. So it does not change. Okay, so to answer this, your question more directly, no. Good. All right. I'm just asking. What about uh, parking, on-street parking, or off-street parking? So off-street parking, it's so this there's typically a negotiation uh, the that happens between developers and the redevelopment board, where parking is expensive to provide if you know if 
it's expensive to provide more than you want. So in terms of the, uh, the parking require, there are minimum parking requirements in the zoning bylaw uh, that uh, developers have to meet, or they can also ask for reductions of up to 75%. Okay, so, the, re the reason for my asking is, if you're going to allow a developer to build more densely, mm -hmm. more densely, wouldn't you of necessity have to provide more off-street parking? So it, it depends on, it will depend on the, you know, depend on what they, they ask for, and it, it's also okay. a matter of, you know, their financing. All right, uh, so, so the one-to-one -one is not necessarily uh, Correct. adopted. All right, great. Um, finally, I just want to find out uh, about whether or not, and I guess I'm just unclear about this, the MBTA Community Act overlay um, eliminates the requirement of affordable housing on any of the overlay buildings. Is this, wait, wait, is it, can, Mr. Weinstein, can, can you explain how that's related to Article 33? Well, if any affordable housing is, could conceivably be affected by this and lost. You're asking, so, will this in fact the eligibility of the town under the MBTA Communities Act? So to the extent that this allows more resident, that being able to come out further on the bottom floors allows more residential space, that could trigger a higher number of inclusionary units. Okay, thank you. And the final question is from the town council. Uh, does the MBT, MBTA Community Act uh, supersede or domi dominate uh, past town zoning regulations on the area that it, over, you know, it overlays? Which, which is the... Um, uh, can you explain how that's relevant to this article? Is it, is it in, uh, incompatible with any zoning that already exists that it now uh, covers? For Wait, example, the, the, the affordable the changes, housing zoning. The, the amendments offered under Article 33, is that what you're asking about? Is that... Yes. I, I think that... And, uh, Right. I, I thought that question was already answered, that it All did right. not affect the eligibility. Is that correct? Under the MBTA Communities Steve Revelock, Redevelopment Board. The MBTA Communities District uh, applies to parcels that have a base district of residential. It does not apply to any business district parcel in the town of Arlington. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Rudick and then uh, Mr. Blandy. Ben Rudick, Precinct 5. Um, can we go back to the image, the graphic by the uh, proponent of From the, the uh, Mr. Greenspawn slides? Yeah, 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 I just think that's, yeah. that's helpful. Um, so, I, I'm sorry, um, did, you get, did you give name in Precinct? I didn't. Oh, yeah, Ben Rudick, Precinct 5. Um, as mentioned previously, my background is in commercial real estate um, for 15 years. I don't do anything around here or, or in New England and have no uh, financial ties to this area besides owning a home. Um, as there's a lot of questions with regard to issues related to commercial real estate development, I thought it'd be helpful to provide a little bit of context as to um, what's happening and what I would expect to happen with this change. Um, first off, at a high level, uh, we're in a moment where it is extremely hard to build anything. Um, we're at record high interest rates and construction loan costs, um, near record high construction costs for hard and soft costs generally. It's just very, very hard to build at all. Um, for the kind of mixed-use developments we're talking about here, it's typically the residential uh, from floors two up that are your money makers, and those provide the economic force that allows the entire development to go forward. Um, therefore, what you would see, I would be shocked if you saw anything on floors four and above besides residential. Um, furthermore, for the districts where this would apply, um, you are likely to see small units. Uh, so we're talking one to two bed units um, that for good or ill do not tend to come with lots of kids like I have um, and are rather beneficial when it comes to the tax base of Arlington. Um, furthermore, um, this can be a very binary thing, namely allowing this kind of additional space, this additional residential space on the fourth and higher floors um, can allow developments to go forward that would otherwise um, not be economically viable. So what this would allow, or nudge towards helping in a rather hostile general environment, would be the construction of new mixed-use space, desirable first floor and second floor commercial space 
um, which is modern and attractive to the type of tenants we'd want here, and I believe a general increase in our tax base. Um, that's it, I would recommend that you support this, um, but if you don't want anything to be built, then you know what to do. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, we'll take Mr. Blandy and then Mr. Schlickman. Charlie Blandy, Precinct 6. Um, I think that uh, I'm here to ask some, uh, some dumb questions. So I'm looking at this diagram here, and then I'd like to see Mr. Loretti's photo again. And I'd like to ask everybody here if they are, if the, the lower diagram in Mr. Greenspan's uh, diagram is, uh, is the same as that. And actually, I'd like to ask Mr. Greenspan if these things are applicable, if they are equivalent to each other, is this a situation? What is the difference between these two situations? Mr. Greenspan, is, uh, is this photograph applicable to the diagram from your slides, okay, I think am, is the question. Am I allowed to ask the redevelopment board in response to something? <laughs> you can, you, uh, name and precinct, and you can ask a question. Uh, Andy Greenspan, Precinct 5. Um, I was actually a little confused by this diagram because uh, I thought Mr. Loretti referenced a front setback required, but I don't see it on, I don't know where you count from, the first to the fourth floor. Um, um, maybe someone from the redevelopment board can answer where the mm. where the front step back is step back where the front step back is required. Mr. Rebola. So the front step back is uh, measured from the property line, um, and in this case, it is above the first floor. And to orient to orient you a little bit, uh, if you're familiar with it, it, there is a on the bottom floor there is a zero foot setback on the front, a zero foot setback on what would be the left side, and I believe. For this building, because it is a corner lot, the portion adjacent to the blue house is, is actually the rear yard. Portion adjacent. So where, where did the front step back have to be then? So in this case, it's on the front of the building. Uh, and the way the, this particular one is designed, uh, it's actually on the second, at the second floor. Okay, so the, the bottom floor with the commercial space comes out a little bit oh, more. Oh, okay. So there's the already a step back. Um, yeah, so I think I, in my diagram, I, for the front part, I was slightly incorrect. So there, for many of these cases, for the fourth floor and up, the front has to have a step back from the lot line. Um, so the bottom building, the bottom building there would have that step back if required. Um, otherwise, I don't know what the rear of that building is, so I can't necessarily say uh, whether this would or would not apply, I think. Um, unless anyone in the redevelopment board knows what the rear uh, setback of that building currently is, the Loretti's building. <laughs> Mr. Revelock, and we're not going to take a field trip to the yeah. site. Steve Revelock, Arlington Redevelopment Board, I do not recall. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, um, I, I didn't hear that. He, he does not recall. Okay, right. thanks. Ask me anything else. Great. I, I, thanks very much. Um, I think that when we provide visual aids, it's really important to be very specific and very applicable about uh, what applies to what. So um, I urge passage of this, and I uh, hope you vote yes. Thanks. Okay, Mr. Schlickman, and then Mix Pretzer from the Satellite Room. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9, motion to terminate debate under all items under this article. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate uh, and a second. All those in favor of terminating debate under Article 33, say yes. Yes. All those opposed, say no. No. Debate is terminated. <laughs> All right, easy, easy. This is a majority vote. Um, and so while we're bringing up uh, voting, I'll just remind folks. Yeah. Um, the... Uh, Ms. Brazil says that she has two-thirds in her notes, but I have majority in mine. Uh, Mr. Cunningham, you can confirm that, right? It is majority, correct? Yeah, it is majority vote. Um, okay, voting is now open. So if you're in favor of the ARB's recommendation of amending Section 552 of the zoning bylaw uh, to change uh, details about... Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Well, you've, you've seen the, the, the language. You, you have that all in the, the bylaws. Um, Vote one for yes to change the bylaw. Uh, vote two 
for no uh, to leave the bylaw as is. Let's close voting. This is again a majority vote. And it passes, 123 in the affirmative, 61 in the negative, one abstention. That brings us to, uh, let's see. Let's see, that was 33. That brings us to Article 35. Um, Ms. Deschler. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. Uh, Article 35 um, involves uh, our local access uh, cable TV network, ACMI. ACMI is entitled to receive a portion of funds um, um, generated by cable companies. State law requires, however, that town meeting vote to appropriate those revenues to ACMI, which is what Article 35 does. The Finance Committee recommends a positive vote on uh, Article 35. Okay, I believe, uh, let's, see, let's uh, switch over to the speaker queue and clear that. Okay, speaker queue is clear, and I want to invite up uh, Mr. Ruderman um, to, um, to speak on this. I believe uh, Mr. Leone, who's the president of the uh, board of ACMI, would be speaking on this tonight, but he is not available tonight, correct? Yes, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Ruderman, Precinct 9. I'm also ACMI's treasurer. Mr. Leone of Precinct 8 and the board president asked me to speak to this tonight. He could not be here tonight. Uh, Thank you for the slides. Next slide, please. He is fulfilling a much more important obligation tonight, that of taking his wife out to dinner for their wedding anniversary. ACMI is not a town office or committee. Uh, it is an independent, nonprofit corporation. Our charter says we are uh, set up in order to provide uh, what's commonly known as the acronym PEG, Public Educational and Governmental Broadcasting, to the residents of the town. Next slide, please. We're quite proud of the job we do. Uh, hundreds of hours of public meetings, uh, a, national, a, a, a weekly newscast that has, for the last two years, been uh, awarded national awards for excellence, and this is done with volunteers, as well as our, our own employed staff. We teach people how to put their ideas and their creativity on screen. Thank you, next slide. Most of all, we wanted a couple of minutes to speak to Article 35 to explain why it is that it's here in the budget, as Ms. Dessler, Deschler said, the town has invoked its right to, to tax the revenues of the cable providers in town. This slide is slightly inaccurate. Um, the town imposes, according to federal law that goes back to the 1980s, a 5% tax on the revenues that the cable providers in town earn. That money is then available to the town to provide to its to its contracted organization to provide local cable access broadcasting, which is ACMI. However, that money flows to the town first, therefore we, town meeting, have to vote to, to uh, enable the select board to move that money from the, from the municipal fisc over to ACMI. I've been treasurer of ACMI for seven years. Every year our revenue has gone down because it depends upon that 5% of the revenue from cable companies here in Arlington. Every time somebody cuts the cable, as I have and many others, that revenue decreases. In the seven years I've been treasurer, we're down 20% in our revenue. Next slide, please. What does this mean? Well, COVID hid some of the effects when so many uh, town boards went to a hybrid or, or a streaming only uh, you know, model of presenting their public meetings. As we come out of the COVID crisis, it becomes more apparent. ACMI doesn't have the budget to afford the stringers that we used to send to the smaller public meetings. For instance, just to pick one for example, if the Arlington Redevelopment Board chooses to hold a meeting in person, not in a hybrid format, we can't send somebody to broadcast that meeting. You either go to it 
or you are shut out. That's the difference that we provide. We give, you, we give the entire public here in Arlington a seat right here in town meeting at the school committee, at the select board, and a great portion of the money that we've received from our cable providers for capital improvements have gone to making this room essentially a sound stage so that when the images go out, they are tracked on, they are recorded by multiple cameras that are independently operated, you know, the thousands of feet of cable that have been one, run underneath this floor and above this ceiling that send the images out with an explanation of what article we're voting on, the name of the speaker, the Chiron that says what the matter is about, that all goes out from here because we've invested in creating our own studio in order to do it. If you go out those doors, stage left, and turn left right across the hallway from, from the men's toilet, you will, see, you will see a broadcast studio built into what had been the coat closet. We send out the image from there. And believe me, those, the, uh, Sean Keane and the folks who send out that meeting, next slide please, uh, send out the images of the meeting. We're working double time earlier on to make sure that the sound got right. That's one of the things we can do because we've invested in the technology right here. We asked the fin FinCom to re-vote um, our budget because our budget is falling even more precipitously than we first imagined at the beginning of the year. How are we gonna make this up? Well, we're learning how to fundraise fast. We've brought on board members who will help us with that. We don't have a history of it. Uh, we are lobbying our state um, uh, legislate, legislative de 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 delegation, Senate and House, to advance a bill that is in committee right now that would spread that input across the streaming services as well as the cable companies. But that could be years off, and we can't count on it. We have closed an, uh, a satellite studio, and we've lost personnel. Next slide, please. Another option is to come directly to you and ask you, the town, for a direct subsidy. It's not unheard of. Brookline gets $200,000 a year. Lexington gets, Lexington's Community Access Studio gets $150,000 a year. We're not at that point yet, but we're getting perilously close to that. Next slide, please. We are going to be mounting a, a uh, a, a campaign for, for uh, donations and for more widespread public support. I hope you will give it your, consider, your, your, your very, very serious consideration. And remember that we are giving the public, the mo in the bro most broad terms, the ability to see what goes on in Arlington. That's the end of the slides. Thank you very much. And uh, I will urge you for a positive a vote on 35. Thank you. Um, from the speaker queue, we have uh, Ms. Garber and then Pi Fisher. Judith Garber, Precinct 4. I was just curious about looking at the supplement versus the original. Um, so it looks like in the supplement, we now like the budget is balanced, the revenues equal the expenses. And in the previous one, there was that $50,000 deficit, which looks like there's more from miscellaneous income in this new one and also fewer expenses. So is this just a result of like, you're expecting more donations and you're cutting employees? Yeah, Mr. Ruderman or Ms. Deschler? Primarily we have savings. We have savings from the years when our, our revenues under that 5% tax on, on cable profits in town exceeded our expenses. And we banked them, we invested them. We've been drawing down on those for the last four years. Obviously that can't go on forever, but that's how we intend to make up next year's budget shortfall without laying off any other members of the staff. All right, that's, thanks, that's great. I, I'm voting for this. Thank you. Seeing no other speakers in the queue, uh, Pi Fisher has removed themselves from the queue. Uh, so we'll proceed directly to a vote on the main motion for Article 35. And so keep in mind, as, as Ms. Garber pointed out, th this is from the second supplement to the report of the Finance Com Committee, which everyone should have a copy of tonight. If you don't have a copy, you can get it in the back of the hall um, for updated numbers. 
Okay, so voting is now open. So this is a vote to appropriate the cable revenues projected for the fiscal year 2025 as specified in the Finance Committee's second supplement to the report of the Finance Committee. That's in writing here. Uh, and it's a majority vote. So uh, anyone in favor can press one for yes, two for no to reject that, uh, that appropriation, uh, and three to abstain. Voting is closed. This is majority vote. And it, it is unanimous, 182 in the affirmative with two abstentions. Uh, Ms. Deschler, that brings us to Article 36. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. Um, in 2017, town meeting created a parking benefits district in the metered, metered area of Arlington Center. This allows the town to take the net income after expenses um, from the parking meters to make improvements to the area. The improvements that are anticipated being made this year are listed on the back of the select board's report on page A3. Um, by voting to approve Article 36, um, town meeting is endorsing those improvements and the expenditures sent forth in the Finance Committee's vote. Um, in 2025, revenue is expected to be 422030 and expenses are expected to be uh, $532,208. The deficit, that, that delta, will be made up from um, the fund balance, which is a very healthy $513,000. Uh, the Finance Committee urges a positive vote on Article 36. Thank you. So let's switch over to this. We've got a couple of uh, requests to speak. I don't, uh, I don't know if those were intentional or not, but why don't you just clear that, and folks, apologize for that. You can, you can click in again. And also, I, I want to invite up uh, Mr. Jameson. Uh, the, you, you held this from the consent agenda. Did you want to speak to this? Pass. Okay. And seeing no speakers, we will go straight to a vote on the main motion. Uh, and it is a majority vote. And this is to endorse the expenditures from the parking fund as specified in the Finance Committee report. Uh, We're still switching over to voting. We're still working on that. Um, and voting is now open. So if you're in favor of endorsing those expenditures from the parking fund, uh, as specified in the Finance Committee report, you press one for yes. If you're against endorsing, press two for no or three to abstain. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion passes, 180 in the affirmative, two in the negative, one abstention. Uh, let's see, and that takes us to Article 42, Ms. Deschler. This is the part of the meeting where things start to go really quickly, apparently. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. Um, the Commonwealth Transportation Infrastructure Fund holds money that the state collects uh, from companies like Lyft and, and Uber. The state then disperses those funds back to the cities and towns based on the number of rides that originate there. Um, this year, uh, and the use of those funds are restricted. Um, this year, the town is expected to receive $23,615.20, which uh, will be used this year to support the town's blue bike program. Uh, the Finance Committee recommends a positive vote on Article 42. Okay. That's Switch over to the speaker queue. I see no names in the speaker queue. Mr. Loretti. <laughs> and then Mr. Kepline. <clears throat> Thanks, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. Can somebody tell me what else uh, money in this fund can be used for? Uh, Ms. Deschler, do you, or, or, or Mr. Feeney, or Mr. McGee? Go right down the line. Jim Feeney, town manager, largely any transportation related initiatives. Does that include uh, pedestrian safety? Yes. Thanks. Um, I think for that reason, I'm going to be voting against this. We had an appropriation of $100,000 a couple of years ago. Um, for bl the Blue Bikes program. It was a quote, unquote, one-time expenditure. 
Um, I frankly think there are a lot better things we can do with this money, like pedestrian safety, rather than subsidizing um, you know, some big tech firm. So I urge you to vote no, and let's see if we can't use this for better purposes. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Kepline, and then Mr. Blandy. Mark Kepline, Precinct 9. Um, about that 100,000 that we voted a couple of years ago, um, under which article? What are you, re what are you referring to? Um, it was kind of a um, uh, um, critical care for the blue bike system that we approved. And it was going to be a one-time thing. And by after that, the bikes were going to be sustainable and not need external funding, um, much like the system runs in other cities and towns. So I, I'd like some information on why uh, ridership goals are still failing, and also um, if this is under a new contract, or as before the money was used to extend the original contract, um, it, do we have a new contract? Uh, hold on, uh, Mr. Feeney, is this related to the blue bike contract at all? Jim Feeney, town manager, we are still under that existing blue bike contract. Right. I believe it is up for negotiation in, in about two years, I think. Do you have any ridership numbers for blue bike? Is there a trend, upward or downward? It is I indeed mean, trending upward, thank you. Well, it still seems like a waste of money, totally, because anyone in, Ar in Arlington can afford to buy a bike or even just pick up one of the many free bicycles and they don't have to rent one. So, but, uh, Mr. Kaplan, what, what's the relation to, to the scope of yeah, this article? Well, we yeah. shouldn't spend any money on this. What's that? We shouldn't spend any money on blue bikes and vote no. This is throwing good money after bad. It's, it's unsustainable and it's a failure in Arlington. Or I guess maybe I'm just not aware of how the, the, the blue bike contract is related to the Commonwealth so, Transportation Infrastructure Okay, so the fund. blue bike contract specifies there's a minimum level of usage. And if that's not met, then the town has to kick in money to pay for overnight redistribution of bikes and the maintenance of them, et cetera. Okay. Um, and we haven't been meeting that level. Uh, so it's an unwanted resource that we keep throwing more money at. And so your contention is that, that less could be appropriated to support the needs of the infrastructure of like the roads if that other program is yeah, more successful? Yeah, so, okay, so for example, pedestrian crosswalks are awful in this town and very little has is, is happened to improve them. Street lights, when they were replaced, they were just replaced on the existing telephone poles owned by Verizon, which are not located near crosswalks. They're just located in order to put the weight of the wires. So the, the crosswalks are poorly lit, and there's been really no effort to improve the lighting at crosswalks. It's, it's a safety hazard, and the crosswalks aren't getting repainted often enough. So, th so that money could actually save lives instead of being a recreational facility for a small number of bicyclists. Okay. So just to be clear, like, like obviously we're not affecting anything here under this article related to the Blue Bikes program, but uh, you, you of course can state your opinion that... Oh yeah, yeah. so I, 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 I'm voting no and don't appropriate that money to Blue Bikes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Blandy and then Mr. Schlickman. Charlie Blandy, Precinct 6. I move to terminate debate on this article and all matters before it. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate and we have a second. All those in favor of terminating debate under Article 42 say yes. Yes. All those opposed say no. no. Debate is terminated. So we'll now go to a vote on the main motion of Article 42. This is majority vote. And uh, this is 
uh, for appropriating the sum of $23,615.20 received by the town from the Commonwealth Transportation in Infrastructure Fund to address the impact on transportation network services. Um, voting is now open. If you're in favor of that appropriation, press one for yes. If you're opposed, press two for no, or three to abstain. It's closed voting. And the motion passes 150 in the affirmative, 33 in the negative, four abstentions. That takes us to Article 48. Ms. Deschler? Oh, no, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yep. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. Um, uh, Article 48 comes before town meeting each year. Um, no money is being sought to replenish the legal defense fund. Um, this article this year relates to indemnification. Um, the town has opted, pursuant to state law, uh, to pay certain medical and surgical expenses of police officers and firefighters um, who are retired due to an ac accidental disability. This article covers the cost of such expenses as well as the medical pay panel appointed by the town to review funding requests. Um, this year, the town meeting is being asked to appropriate $15,161.34 for indemnification of medical costs for our uh, employees, uh, and the Finance Committee recommends a positive vote. Okay, thank you, and uh, according to my records, Mr. Loretti, you had held this from the consent agenda. Do you want to speak to this? And the, uh, the speaker queue is now open and empty. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. I have a question about um, Section A of this article, um, which has to do with indemnica indemnification of legal expenses for town employees. And my question is this. Earlier this year, the civil rights suit that Donovan Johnson brought against the town was settled. I'd like to know how much the town indemnified the police office invo officers involved for legal expenses, and why isn't that reflected in this article? Ms. Deschler? As stated in our report, no money is being sought through this article for the Legal Defense Fund as no money is necessary. But that, but that was the answer. Um, okay, seeing no other speakers, we will go to a vote on the main motion. This is a majority vote, and uh, this is a vote to uh, appropriate $15,161.34 uh, for the purposes that you can see in the Finance Committee report. And so if you're in favor of that appropriation, press one. Uh, well, voting's not open yet, but... Oh, wait, the light's not on. Okay, voting is now open. Uh, if you're in favor of that appropriation, press one for yes, two for no, and three to abstain. And if we could leave voting open just a little bit longer since uh, the light was not on right away. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion passes 174 in the affirmative, two in the negative, six abstentions. That takes us to Article 48. Ms. Deschler? I'm sorry, 49, Article 49. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. The Water Bodies Fund was established in 2008 and was initially focused on spy pond um, monotony rocks in the reservoir. At the Finance Committee's urging, uh, the Water, Water Bodies Working Group, which also includes members of the Conservation Commission, has expanded its supervision to all of the water bodies in town, and that includes, uh, I believe, five lakes in, and uh, ponds and nine streams. Um, the fund is used to test, treat, and maintain our various water bodies in town. Um, there are a number of ongoing projects aimed at improving the water qualities of these town assets. The Finance Committee recommends that town meeting vote to appropriate $85,000 for um, to continue this work. Uh, you will also hear, I think, in connection with the next article, that an additional $40,000 will be used uh, for a study of the detention pond at um, McClendon Park, which is also uh, a water body that is covered by Article 49. Again, the Finance Committee recommends a positive vote on Article 49. 
Okay, thank you. And let's switch over to the speaker queue and clear it. Okay, speaker queue is now open. Mr. Jaspin. Uh, if I, <clears throat> excuse me, Barry Jasmine, Precinct 18. If I understood what Ms. Deschel just said, uh, the Water Bodies Commission now covers all lakes and streams in the town of Arlington. Does that include uh, streams that previously existed on the surface and were uh, buried in a culvert a long time ago, for example, Clematis Brook? Does anyone know? Ms. Deschel? I don't, I don't know. Uh, did, did, uh, Mr. White, do you have? Open streams. Open streams. Open streams. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, seeing no other speakers in the queue, we will go directly to a vote on the main motion, which is uh, an appropriation of $85,000 to the Water Bodies Fund uh, for the town's water bodies. Um, okay, the green light is not on. Okay, voting is now open. So please check your handsets to see if voting has been confirmed for your handset. Uh, if you're in favor of that appropriation of $85,000 for uh, uh, the town's water bodies, press one for yes, two for no, and three to abstain. Yep. Just five more seconds. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion is unanimous, 144 in the affirmative. Um, that takes us to Article 50, and it's about 9.30, and we do have an amendment, and I imagine we'll have some debate on Article 50. Uh, so let's take a 10-minute recess and come right back. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Okay, we're, we're, we're back in session. I didn't see that. Okay, so we are at Article 50, and um, let's see, uh, Ms. Rowe, did you want to introduce this for us? Yes, my name is Clarissa Rowe. I'm chair of the Community Preservation Act committee, and I'm from Precinct 4. Um, I have a slideshow. Ah, I see. Um, these are some of the people that helped me with this. Next slide, please. This is for next year. Next slide. For you town meeting members that don't know about the Community Preservation Act, it's got three legs, historic preservation, Open space and recreation, open space and recreation, and community housing. Next slide, please. This pie chart shows how we have to spend the money. So 10% from each category, and we have 5% for the expenses. Next slide, please. So we're going to start with community housing. This is a special needs. Um, building that's going to be built by um, the Arlington Housing um, Authority. And this is, as many of our projects are, sort of seed money to get things started. It will be a standalone building for um, people that need real help. Next slide, please. This is 10 Sunnyside which, as you know, has gone through the permitting. They need an additional 500000 for construction, and it's a great project and, um, in East Arlington, and I think it's a win-win um, for us. Next slide, please. This is um, $50,000 for HCA again for their homeless um, prevention program. Next slide, please. And the Somerville Homeless Coalition has a very little bit of money, but what they do is they, um, this money pays the differential, differential for um, their tenants in the housing 
that need additional money and can't pay it. It's a very good program. It's a very um, good organization. And the last housing piece is the Shea House Roof Repair on Wellington Street. It's owned by the Salvation Army. If people have questions, I believe John Marr is here to answer questions. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's community housing. The next um, slide, please, is our historic preservation um, slide, and this is for digitizing and preserving Arlington's marriage records. And you can see they're in great shape. <laughs> Let the record show that they are not in great shape. <laughs> they need some help. And this is um, beginning to start that. Next slide, please. This is the Memorial Garden in um, right over there. And it's finishing up a long-term project. And it's a wonderful um, renovation of an Olmsted Brothers design. And the um, reflecting pool was put in a couple of years ago. It's terrific. Next slide, please. And the next one is Foot at the Rocks, a battlefield um, memorial. Um, and that's the end of the historic preservation. I'm being very quick because I don't need to read the slides. You can. Um, open space. Um, this is the McLennan Detention Bond survey. There are a couple of um, retention ponds that they're looking into. And I think the Finance Committee has given them some money, too, from the water bodies. The next one is um, the public land management addendum. This was an earlier CPA project. It was very successful, and they want more money to expand it some. Um, it's not very much money. Next slide, please. This is the Minuteman um, bikeway design at Ryder Street and at Burns, at Burns Arena. One of the problems we have with this, which is why we gave less money than we were asked for, because this, the Minuteman bikeway, is owned by the MBTA. And they are incredibly difficult to work with. So instead of funding this, the amount of money that we were asked for, this money will be to investigate how to deal with the MBTA. <laughs> We've learned our lesson. We tried to do a project in Arlington Heights and got shot down. So this is a way of getting it started. It's a complicated site. Um, because it's also got a couple of streets near it. So it's the beginning of something. Next slide, please. Um, this Crosby Park Court and Park renovation was probably, um, in terms of our public process, the most um, controversial one that we had. And a lot of neighbors turned out, and they are very glad that the Park and Recreation Commission is going to be really looking to figure out what the program should be there. And because of that, we believe that we should fund it. Next slide, please. Um, and this is Monotomy Rocks Park playground and picnic area, um, which of course breaks my heart because I was one of the people that built the old one. 30 years ago, <laughs> it was time for something new. So, and last slide, um, which I'm sure you can't read, but tells you about all the monies that have been appropriated. And um, if you have any questions, I'm here to talk about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll now take uh, Mix Pretzer from the Satellite Room who has uh, an amendment to, to offer. Yeah, okay. uh, as David Presser, precinct 17, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I would like to start by saying that I really appreciate all the work the Community Preservation Act Committee has 
done. I think this is a hard job. We'll have to consider. And I think they've got some really uh, great projects. However, I have heard from constituents and other county members, and I myself have some concerns about one of the projects, the foot of the rock uh, project that I'd like to talk about now. Next slide. So you know, we organized this postcard. This is what the foot of the rock memorial looked like about 100 years ago. Um, this is a memorial to one of the battles or some of the fights that happened on the first day of the Revolutionary War, which is obviously, you know, Arlington, we love our Revolutionary War history, and I think that's great. Um, next slide. And this is uh, some of the memorials we have today. This is the same one from 100 years ago, and one that was added about 50 years ago to further commemorate it. And next slide. And this is sort of what the overall of the rocks area is. It's a very small site. It is currently uh, open space with trees and grass that, you know, is, you know, so it's a small site, but it's a, a beautiful site um, that adds value to locals. Um, you might think, you know, given this is historical preservation, that the money from the foot of the rocks might be you know, referring to what it was like 100 years ago, but that's not actually the case. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is from the foot of the rocks master plan. Um, which, as you can see, is proposing basically leveling and paving this entire site, you know, adding a bunch of uh, memorial stuff that is sort of removing its open space value. And, I, and I've heard concerns, but I have concerns that it's not the best use for this site. It does not preserve anything of the historical landscape. It does not provide value to local residents. Um, yeah, the, there's a, some pockets that might serve as a tourist attraction. If so, is that it's situated at a dangerous intersection that has limited uh, parking and ability to accommodate additional visitors. So, I'm not, so I feel like for, for attracting visitors, other sites like the Jason Russell House are a better way of commemorating the sighting on the first day of the revolution that has better, more educational value, more ability to accommodate uh, guests. And if this does not end up attracting tourists, I, I don't think paving this open space provides value to, um, to local residents. Uh, next slide. This is another view from the master plan. Uh, you can see that it would know it has this sign and you can see this sort of existing dangerous action, uh, intersection where Mass Ave meets Lowell Street. Next slide. I also want to draw your attention to a, a completely separate project, the Appleton Street Corridor Safety Improvements. Uh, this is affecting the same area uh, at the same time, but with different funding. The CPA funding cannot be used for traffic calming. Um, so this funding does not affect the safety improvements. I think, given this is a dangerous intersection, it would be prudent to focus on the safety improvements uh, first and have that revolved and then consider um, how to use the site that in light of the safety improvements. Um, I, I would note that the Alpha Street Corridor plan would create additional pedestrian space on the other side of the street, which might allow for further commemoration of the site at the foot of the rock without requiring paving existing reasons. Next slide. So, um, in conclusion, if you pass my amendment that would avoid spending $450,000 on the foot of the rock project with CPA money, that money could be spent on other projects at the discretion of the Community Preservation Act Committee next year. Um, regardless of whether or not this funding passes, this project is in time for the 250th anniversary of the site. So I believe it would be prudent to at least wait until the safety improvements are completed and consider if this site is the best site for remembering and education about our part of that siting, or if that money was there to spend elsewhere. Um, so I hope that you will join me in voting for my amendment and you know, save this money for other much needed uh, affordable housing or historical preservation pro projects in the future. I would like to move that you submit submitted press sir, and thank you. And do we have, do, do, I didn't hear a motion. Was there a motion? I, I just said I'd like to move my amendment. Oh, okay, sorry. So we have a motion and we have a second. So it, it, uh, the Pretzer amendment is now pending before us. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, so let's now, uh, uh, let's do the speaker queue now. Apologies for not doing that earlier. So we'll move over to the speaker queue and clear that. Um, okay, speaker queue is now open. And I know that uh, Mr. Tosti 
uh, had a presentation that was relevant to the project that was just mentioned, uh, the foot of the rock. So uh, can we bring up Mr. Tosti's uh, presentation? Okay. Uh, fellow town meeting members, my name is Al Tosti from Precinct 17. Uh, I'm the prime sponsor, along with a lot of other people, for the Foot of the Rocks uh, crusade. Now, basically, uh, in, on April 19th, uh, 1775, uh, British soldiers early in the morning moved out of Boston in order to seize military supplies in Concord. Uh, they marched right up here through Mass Ave. Uh, in Lexington, they came across a militia that uh, there was a fight, nobody knew who started it, then moved on to Concord. Unfortunately for them, they found out that the Concord militia had already moved all the stores from the, uh, from the area. Um, there was a small skirmish at the North Bridge. Uh, on the way back, as the British soldiers moved out of Concord to back towards Boston, uh, they were set upon by militias from the areas Concord, Bedford, uh, Lincoln, uh, to the point where they were desperate when they got back to Lexington Common. There, uh, Colonel Smith's desperate men were uh, reinforced by General Percy with about another thousand troops. Uh, Percy gathered his troops, Colonel Smith's men in the middle to protect them. Uh, they were exhausted, uh, and they continued to march out of Lexington down towards, through East Lexington, without too much problem. They came down Pierce Hill, which is right near the foot of the rocks, and 1,800 militia were confronted by 17, sorry, 1,800 British soldiers were confronted by 1,700 militia from 35 companies all the way from Danvers in the north to Dedham in the south. This was gonna turn out to be a real bloodbath. Fortunately for the British, they had bought two field pieces from Boston. They lumbered up the field pieces, they started blazing away at the militia. Now these militia were farmers, they weren't soldiers. So when this cannon started going off, they just headed for the hills, quite literally. Uh, and this opened up for General Percy and the British troops to start marching. But the militia came back at them and at them. This was the battle, the, the foot of the rocks battle was the beginning of Bloody Mile. More British soldiers and American militia died in that mile than in the entire rest of the battle uh, that day. Um, all the way down from Foot of the Rocks, Jason Russell House to Arlington Center uh, was a continuous battle. And it started at a Foot of the Rocks. And the Foot of the Rocks was the first place that enough American militia was there to confront the situation. Uh, second slide, please. What I want to do, and I only have a few minutes, and I got a lot of questions were asked that I want to try to answer. So where is the Foot of the Rocks? Uh, as you can see, it is. Okay. You can see the slides over on the side. I think. Try over here. Yeah. Okay. No, that one doesn't work. Okay. Well, the foot of the rocks he is in this area, middle area. The it's a hi very historic area. You've got the Schwamm Mill uh, to the north of it. You've got the Benjamin Lock. Uh, Captain Benjamin Locke House to this off of uh, Appleton Street. I don't think this is really working all that well, so I'll just skip it. Uh, and so this is where the foot of the rocks is. The road configurations are not quite accurate uh, in this, but it's right where Lowell is. Now, one of the problems with this area is Mass Ave and Lowell Street become a racetrack. And one of the things that this combined with the Appleton Street project is really going to help a great deal with the safety of the area. Uh, next project, next slide first. Okay, here's what we have now. We've got uh, three rocks that, uh, no, and plaques that nobody reads. Uh, and if you really wanted to read it, they're hard to read. They don't really say that much about it. This was the major battle of the beginning of the Revolutionary War. This is where 1,700 militia, Americans, our forefathers, stood to fight the British in, in, uh, invasion of our, home, of our homeland. And this doesn't really say anything about it. Um, next slide, please. Now, what happened was, we, this is the third time Foot of the Rocks has come before you. The first time we got a plan, we put together plans, we held public hearings, uh, and this was one of the, this is the plan that we finally came up with. 
uh, which is going to be modified in the next couple of slides. But we're trying to do is show, uh, improve the uh, traffic going across and put an area so the L shape there is all going to be panels. And we really did two things to change this feedback from the public hearings. Number one, we got rid of the cannon. Um, I was a little disappointed with it, but people didn't like the cannon, so we got rid of the cannon. Uh, we were going to steal one from Watertown Arsenal, but it, it just didn't work out. Uh, the second thing we did was we broadened this from a battlefield memorial to a memorial, uh, uh, to a uh, historic center about the town of Arlington, or more likely the area of Monotomy, its people, uh, who lived here, what was the economy like. Uh, we broadened the scope, we brought in the, uh, joined our group, the chairman of the Human Rights Commission, uh, to talk more about the people who lived here, maybe the Native Americans, uh, slaves, colored people who were both either slaves or free people of color. Uh, so we broadened it out to more than just a battlefield uh, memorial. Next slide, please. Now, we had to do a lot of modifications. Our architect met with the architect who put together the Appleton Street project. And they went back and forth on this, because the Appleton Street project, off to the right, uh, it creates some bump outs. And these bump outs are really going to be important for uh, helping this. It's going to try to curtail that racetrack of people going on and off of Lowell Street. Uh, and that's going to be to the right here. So this is sort of the final uh, plan that we voted on. As you can see, we've got uh, the stairs is gone. Uh, the sidewalk along the side is gone. Uh, and we're just focusing on the uh, panel. So uh, in three areas, there's going to be uh, the rocks, so the rocks, the uh, plaques and the stones that were there right now, they will be integrated into the whole plan. And there will be panels all along the sides, the L shape, that start about, you know, the whole history of this battle and also of the people of Arlington. There's an obelisk. You see there's a uh, triangle we're, there. We're at, we're at time, Mr. Tossi, if you could just finish up very, okay. very briefly. Um, and so uh, the next slide just has the, uh, a little bit about a different view of it. And I've got all the questions I've had. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to answer it. Uh, I can tell you about the uh, money and how things will go, but I guess I'll just have to wait for your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so now looking at the, the speaker queue, I'm just gonna take uh, two speakers. I don't think we've heard from this town meeting out of order, and then we'll go back to the top. We'll take uh, Ms. Gruber and then Ms. Pennerin, and then we'll start at the top. Oh, and also it looks like we lost the timer on the center podium. Um, so you might have to look elsewhere for the time until we get that correct. Could someone from, uh, perhaps from IT fix that in the meantime? Um, uh, Ms. Gruber, go ahead. Uh, Rebecca Gruber, Precinct 10. Uh, first of all, thank you for all the efforts of the Community Preservation Act Committee to evaluate the many applications you receive. Um, I just have a few questions about the Foot of the Rocks Battlefield Memorial Project for which you've recommended an allocation of $450,000 this year. So my first question, Mr. Moderator, is how much has um, the Community Preservation Act Committee allocated to the Foot of the Rocks project so far prior to this year? Like and from, how much of those funds have been spent? Like from previous projects? Uh, Ms. Ro? Or Ms. Bongiorno? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Christine Bongiorno, uh, Deputy Town Manager of Operations, uh, and also the CPA Assistant. <laughs> uh, so far, the committee has appropriated $162,000 uh, in two different fiscal years, and the current balance of that is $116,180. That remaining balance will be used to uh, do the final design as well as uh, project uh, construction administration. Thank you. Um, I understand the project proponents asked uh, the Community Preservation Act Committee to bond the project. I'm curious as to what that means. Um, you know, if uh, that had been agreed to, what would that have meant in terms of the town's financial obligations, and what was the response regarding bonding? Um, the committee discussed it. 
Bonding would um, re require that a lot of the CPA money is held for a while, and there's a lot of money that has to be spent every year for the debt, debt um, service. Um, the committee decided that Foot of the Rocks was not appropriate for bonding. Something like buying the Mugar site, perhaps, <laughs> or, or fixing Town Hall might be a sort of once-in-a-lifetime project um, would be appropriate. When they made that request, did they give a sense for how much money they were looking to have bonded altogether? So the total cost of the project is what I'm asking about. Yeah. At, the, at that time, it was 1.2 million. So in addition to the 450,000? No. As in total, 1.2 right. million. Right. Um, and I haven't seen the latest cost of estimate, so I don't know what it is. OK. Had the project organizers raised any funds from other sources? I had understood that that was originally <laughs> part of what they intended. Um, if, if you have, how much? What percentage of the project's total costs? How confident are you going to be able to raise that kind of money? Um, let me just give you one thing as far as the bonding. One of the problems with the uh, project is cash flow when the money comes in. Uh, if we get a earmark from the state, for example, we might not get that money actually until October. We need to start work in July. So the reason for the request for the borrowing was so that we could go ahead, because we had the authorization, when the money came in from the state, we could, we could pay it back. So, but anyway, as uh, uh, Ms. Rose said, they turned that down. Excuse as far me, can I just ask one question about that? I understand you serve on the Finance Committee. Is the Finance Committee generally in support of CPAC bonding projects? Um, I, I don't know if that issue has come before the Finance Committee or the Selectmen. Thank you. Okay, the, um, right now the $450,000 that we're act asking under the Community Pre Preservation Act is the key. Um, if the uh, town meeting is good enough to provide that, uh, uh, award that here, then we are going to use that tomorrow to apply for a state grant uh, which requires matching. Uh, and that grant is be another $250,000. Uh, and I think our project is just meets all the requirements right on. In addition, we have a fairly good assurance of another 200,000 from other sources, primarily federal, I can't get into detail right now, and maybe another 50,000 for benches, trees, uh, water fountains, things like that from the DPW budget. Uh, we have a personal commitment from one individual of 25,000. Um, we also are um, seeking earmark funds from the state, and we have, uh, we're seeking donations from the largest uh, taxpayers in the state. We've put out about uh, four to six, applica not applications, but requests. So we're looking for all that to come together. Uh, right now, we're uh, estimating the uh, project will cost approximately a million dollars, but we're also asking the architect to, cut, to have options to cut back. Uh, and you've already seen that in that last slide because the sidewalks are gone, the curb cuts are gone, the ramp's gone, you know, uh, and that should reduce the price. We're also thinking, uh, if we have to, of putting a mural on one side, a painted mural, instead of uh, our granite. Um, so we, we're looking at ways to cut back the cost to meet the money we have. Um, and, but just to be clear, you haven't raised any of this money yet in the past two years of... Um, work on this project? Well, it's, it's, it's hard to go out and, and look for money when we, we had to go through, first of all, 50000 to raise for the initial plans, hire a landscaped architect, come up with the master plan, which is on the website uh, and was put here. And then we uh, asked for 112000 which was donated uh, to uh, final working drawings, which is what some of the stuff you get there, plus bid specs. Uh, to go that. Now, most of that hasn't been spent. Some of that will be spent during the actual project on that. But it's, it's all based on the, uh, this $450,000 from the uh, CPA, because it's hard to go out and look for this two hundred dollars or that two hundred dollars unless we've got about half of it covered. And finally, um, I understand that uh, the project proponents are targeting completion in time for the 2025 celebration. How confident are you in making that deadline? Depends who I talk to. 
now there's no buildings here. The, 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 it's, it's basically a landscape re redoing the land. Um, my guess is about 50-50. We need to start the work in July. Uh, it's about a four-month project. Now, some of the work, like the panels and stuff, can be installed in March and April. Uh, so so I'm, I'm reasonably optimistic. If I try not to talk to Clarissa Rowe, who is also a landscaped architect, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're she says it's like building a kitchen. It always takes longer than you think it's going to be. So. Okay, and we're, we're at time now. So we're going to take uh, Mrs. Penrin yes. next. I'm going to be quick. Um, we're, 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 no, we're out of time. If we have more questions, we, we, we can get into it. Excuse me? If we have more questions about it, we can get into it, but we're going to take the next speaker now. Okay. okay. Thank fine. you. Uh, Mrs. Penneron and then Mr. Benson. Kristen Penneron, uh, Precinct 20. So I actually, this is my first time speaking before the mic at town meeting, so please let me know if you have difficulty hearing me. I um, live in Precinct 20, and I represent proudly a precinct that has not been redistricted recently, but has a little bit of an odd shape. And I am down near the foot of the rocks in the little tail of Precinct 20. This is valuable open space, which is visible along a major transit corridor in town. It is um, a space that every mode of transportation passes by, and it is also a gateway space that connects um, several different neighborhoods that are, that are close to my residence including um, providing a safe passageway for Audison students who want to come downhill and cross over the Appleton um, area that's being renovated for traffic safety concerns. So what I wanted to say, I was actually hoping to ask some of the same questions that have been asked recently, and I've also been um, emailing town officials to ask. I have some general concerns about the price tag on this project, but I think the co-funding model is a strong one and a strong basis on which to proceed. Um, I don't think that the town should continue to go above and beyond what's being asked now, but to me, on balance, I think it's a reasonable investment for the town to make. I've also received some assurances that if co-funding is not secured, the balances that haven't been spent, if, the, if they're not able to break ground on the project, the balances that are assigned to this project from CPA money this, this year would actually revert back to the CPA and could be used for other projects. So based on the questions that I've asked, I've been reassured in this regard. Um, but I will say, you know, I'm speaking about this as being a gateway space. It's usable open space, which is really precious in Arlington. Um, and I think that the designs that I've seen and that I've given feedback on, like remove the cannon from the intersection where the children are going to play in traffic, have, have really brought us to a place where we're going to have um, open space of a better and different kind in this area. So for instance, the water bubbler that I think is proposed to go in would actually be very useful to cyclists. It would be easy for coming up the bike path or coming up Mass Ave to connect and get water. Um, and I think it does actually have a lot of potential as a gathering space in the Heights. The Schwamm Mill is already a really wonderful gathering space, but I think it would be good to have another one. Um, I also see this as an area that is a gateway zone to the Heights Commercial District, which is I think a very vibrant area, but is also being revitalized in ways that I think that we're seeing and experiencing for the better in our local neighborhood. So I, that's basically the extent of my thoughts, but um, did Mrs. Rowe want to add anything to the discussion um, to follow on the, the time that was left? I, I, she's certainly welcome to if there is a, no? Okay. Ms. Rowe. Um, but, but I will say, you know, I, the, the historical content of the site um, is recognized I personally don't think that there's a tremendous rush to try to get this done for the, um, the milestone event that's happening. I think this project can take time if it needs to, but so much planning has gone into it that, um, that I think it's personally the right time to move ahead with the next phase. Thank you, Thank and you. I, I agree with you. It doesn't need to be done by April. Uh, you know, all 2025 are part of the anniversary, and that's where Al and I disagree. But I'm in construction, I understand. The prices are high and it's slow. So I'm trying to be realistic. But thank you for your comments. Okay, we'll take Mr. Benson and then Mr. DeTulio. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Eugene Benson, Precinct 10. After much thought, I've decided I am in favor of the Pretzer Amendment to remove the $450,000 allocation from the Foot of the Rocks project. And I don't take this lightly. 
I know and respect members of the Community Preservation Act Committee that have made the funding recommendation. I was a member of the committee for four years as a redevelopment board representative, but not during the past two years. When I was on the committee, I participated with some of the committee members who are still on the committee and know how hard and diligently the committee members work in reviewing applications and making decisions. When I was on the committee, I did not vote for funds for this project because I thought the project should not be funded as it was presented to the committee, and I still think it should not be funded as it's proposed. Uh, before deciding how to approach this allocation, I asked the current ARB member on the, C on the committee why I should support the allocation for the project. He said, this is almost a quote, there's really no good reason he doesn't think it's a good project. Um, how many of you have been to Concord, to the rude bridge that arched the flood, to quote Emerson, where the embattled farmers stood and fired the shot heard around the world? There we can see and experience the recreation of the bridge across the river and understand and perhaps even feel what it was like to be started there. How many of you have been to Lexington Battle Green, where Captain Parker of the Massachusetts militia, when facing the British regulars, is reported to have said, stand your ground, don't fire unless fired upon, but if they mean to have war, let it begin here. You can stand on that green, look around, and see the buildings that were there at that time. How many of you have been to the Jason Russell House, the site of the bloodiest fighting, on April 19, 1775, the first day of the Revolutionary War, and seen the musket holes in the walls from the British soldiers as they fought and killed and retreated toward Boston. The Jason Russell House is Arlington's rude bridge that arched the flood. It is Arlington's Lexington Battle Green. When I was on the CPA committee, I was proud to recommend funding to keep the Jessel Russell House um, maintained. How many Revolutionary War era houses or structures are there at foot of the rocks? Have you reviewed the proposal for that small, isolated triangle of land, hemmed in by roads, and with nothing historic within sight? Are you satisfied that we should give an additional $450,000 of our limited Community Preservation Act funds for that project when there are so many other needs for historic preservation, affordable housing, recreation, and open space in our town. Can you even see that what they propose is restoration or renovation of a historic property? The CPA standard for historic preservation allocations, I don't see it. They have a nice little project that could be much less expensive, and it's not really historic renovation or restoration. Earlier in this town meeting, the town manager mentioned that the cupola above town hall would soon come down with work funded by the CPA. The exterior of this building, a historic structure, needs much more work, work that could be funded with CPA funds. Think of our parks and open spaces and our need for more affordable housing. Should this foot of the rock projects take precedence over all of those, should 21% of our total CPA allocation for this year be for this project? Let me repeat that number again. 21% of the total allocation for this year for this project. The town's not required to spend all the CPA money in one year. We can keep money in reserve. In this instance, it seems the CPA committee even dipped into the reserve to fund some projects including part of this project. I say, let's move this $450,000 to the reserve for more worthy projects. The law creating CPA gave town meeting the ultimate authority on how to spend CPA funds. My view is that if an allocation is close call, I should defer to the CPA committee's recommendation. I don't think this is a close call at all. I will vote yes on the Pretzer Amendment. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tulio and then uh, Mr. Ruderman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. James DeTulio, Precinct 12. 
I stand before you tonight as a college history major, the son of a high school history teacher, to say something that I hope all of you know. We in Arlington have been robbed. What do I mean by that? Well, we've been robbed. We are the victims of theft, and not just any theft, a grand larceny of historical proportions. Nobody, and I mean nobody, knows about our role on that fateful day on April 19th, 1775. Nobody, even history majors don't know this. I, in fact, did not know it till I moved to this town. And what I love about this town is that it cares about its history. And there's a bunch of people in this town who love their history and love to share it. The problem is we're just sharing it with each other. No one outside our town knows. Occasionally you see an article in GBH or BUR that trumpets it, you know, and it's usually around Patriot's Day. But, you know, you're not seeing a rush of tourists coming to this town. They don't even know about us. In many ways, I'd like to go back to what the poet laureate said at the start of this town meeting, where she did a poem about William Dawes. Frankly, we are the Dawes to Lexington and Concord's Revere. They stole our history. This is outrageous. And, and you know, I, I'm partly joking, but partly I'm not. This is outrageous that Arlington has been left out of this story. Um, the sponsor of the amendment said, uh, you know, we'll bring tourists here if we do this. Like, and maybe I misinterpreted, but it almost sounded like a criticism. What's wrong with tourists? I mean, tourists are, I thought, the lifeblood of a good, healthy economy. Maybe we'd fill some of these empty storefronts if we had tourists that could have, stop and have lunch or buy a trinket or something while they're in Arlington. I see this as good for the economy, especially when we're trying to expand our tax base. Um, just a couple of points to, that the amendment sponsor raised, and I just I wanted to give a, my own kind of take on them. So one of the points was that, uh, according to the Foot of the Rocks master plan, the project would replace a grassy hillside with a leveled paved park with minimal recreational value to local residents. Well, I don't mean to be snippy here, but who says history has to have recreational value? Some place, there's places for recreation, there's places for history. I don't want to put a, a park in the middle of the Jefferson Memorial, you know? I mean, there's places for one thing and places for another. Frankly, this design has a nice mix of both. I think Ms. Mrs. Pennerin put it best. They've kind of found a design that accentuates the history, uh, makes us proud of it, all the history, not just one piece of it, but also has a nice design plan as well. Um, and frankly, if you look at the current prop land there, I mean, this isn't a place where we're gonna build a ball field. This isn't a place where we're gonna have a nice, uh, you know, tr walking path. There's, in fact, uh, that photo taken of, of the property, I think is one of the best days. I, they must have shot it on the best day possible. It's, they ignore there's a giant, I think, electrical transmission box there. There's often trash strewn around. I think one of the monuments got toppled over and hit by a car a few years ago and still standing there. I mean, we desperately need to do something about this. This is not the way you treat your history. Um, there is also a point that $450,000 is a large amount that could provide much greater benefit on affordable housing, open space, or other historical preservation projects. Uh, now, I don't see this as an either or. I see this as both end. We are putting money towards open space in this plan. Uh, CPA, this year's CPA budget. We are putting money towards affordable housing. Why can't we put some money towards historical preservation as well? Um, and to that point, I believe in past budgets, in past years, this town meeting have quite recently appropriated money to for the design of this. I don't know why we appropriated money for the design if we were gonna pull the plug when we got actually a design in our hands to move forward with, a very good design. Uh, the amendment proponent says, even with this funding, the project will not be completed in time for the 250th anniversary next year. Well, there's been some debate about that. I'll come in on a, maybe a, a, a unique side. I don't really care if it's done in time for next year. It'd be nice. But there's going to be so much interest generated across the country in what's going on here next year. That's not going to dissipate anytime soon. People are going to have renewed interest in how the Revolutionary War began, looking at it through a different lens, perhaps, than we ever have before. And I think that's an opportunity for Arlington, whether it's in 2025 or 2026 or even 2027, to enter that debate again forcefully. You know, as a final point, I guess I'd say, uh, well, the amendment proponent also said, 
uh, well, we have the Jason Russell House. Why don't we just kind of make that our historical spot? And I'm paraphrasing, and I apologize if I'm paraphrasing inappropriately, but sort of, you know, why don't we invest in that? Why do we need this other spot here? And I guess I'd say you don't move history, because when you move history, you lose history. We have two spots in town that are very historically important. Why are we combining them? We should be accentuating both of them. Right now, the Jason Russell House is beautiful. Why does the foot of the rocks have to be such, pardon my language, a bit dumpy right now? <laughs> so I think at the end of the day, you know, the history is important. We've lost this battle for a long time, the historical battle. It's time we finally win it. And I respect the amendment sponsor. I just frankly couldn't disagree more. Please, please vote no on this amendment and yes on the CPA budget this year that includes this money. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ruderman next, and then Ms. Dre. I'll remind everyone that the town of Arlington is not at war with the towns of Lexington or Concord. <laughs> no, not yet, Mr. Moderator. Ms. Michael Ruderman, Precinct 9. I've been a member of this committee from, from early on when it was formed. Um, let me speak first to the what us history nerds or history concentrators would call the historicity of the site. No. Mass Ave didn't exist here in 1775. It was too low and swampy. It wasn't until 1811 that the town filled it in. The town, however, we have been memorializing this spot at the intersection with Lowell Street, which was there since 1819, and calling that the foot of the rocks. Why does the phrase matter? From the middle of the 1600s, the foot of the rocks, the base of Pierce's Hill, was the landmark where you knew you weren't in Lexington anymore. You were getting down to where the road leveled out and you were crossing over the town line into Cambridge. Yes, Cambridge. We were a district of Cambridge back then, Monotomy was. But the foot of the rocks as a phrase was memorialized in many of the dispatches, the after action reports, if you will, that were sent back to London that were written into the soldiers' own diaries as to what the hell went wrong. This was supposed to be a simple mission. March out, arrive in Concord at dawn, capture the gunpowder, seize those two bastard traitors, Sam Adams and John Hancock, be home for dinner. It didn't happen that way. In fact, by the time that all the delays in the Royal Troops uh, plans caught up with them, about 2, 2.30 that afternoon, they encountered in Monotomy, starting at about the foot of the rocks, which if you want to see the actual location, it's where Paul Revere Road joins Appleton Street. There's a landmark there. There's a marker, a colonial mile marker with a big eight on it, eight miles to Boston. That was the road. That was Battle Road. But by the time that the Royal Troops got there, they were faced with I am speaking to the historicity of the, of the site and why the Pretzer Amendment should fail okay, okay. and why you okay. should vote for the money. Okay, let's, okay, everybody, everybody. Let's just pause for just a second here. I, I hear when folks call out scope and I make my own determinations and I've already given some latitude about history. Um, there are limits to the capacity, I think, that we all have for hearing the details of history, but uh, Mr. Rudiman, please continue. Thank you. If this site were within the confines of the Minuteman National Historic Park, it would all already be memorialized. It has every characteristic and criterion worthy of documentation and explanation and interpretation. Interpretation is what makes the difference between a road through the woods and the various sites that Minuteman National Historic Park offers to the public as Paul Revere capture site, the Bloody Angle, Parker's Revenge, Merriam's Corner. These are all scenes, places on the physical geography where important events of the day happen. This is one more. It didn't get included in the National Park because it was in the wrong town. We can go a little bit towards rectifying that. Would it bring more traffic to the area? I hope so, honestly. If you go to the Dunkin' Donuts, which really is the only landmark there in the area that anybody recognizes, if you go to the Dunkin' Donuts across the street, you look across Mass Ave, do you see a lot of crowds? Do you see a lot of cars parked? 
Is there room for at least one tour bus that might be coming down the road on its way from the National Park to various sites in Arlington? Yes, there is. That's what we're hoping to create here. Yes, a lasting monument in the year of the 250th anniversary of the founding of the American Revolution. Yes, an interpreted site that explains why the battle in monotony was so important. For one thing, the United States Army says this is where it was born. All the militia and the minute companies, they're different, all of the militias and the minute companies that gathered from all points of the compass in monotony, they stayed together. And they encircled the retreating royal troops. They besieged Boston. The Continental Congress had to recognize that there was an army in the field, as John Adams you know, lectured them. And they sent for a general to command them in Virginia. And they found somebody named Washington who had some, medic who had some military experience. This is where it began. Let's, let's kind of spiral this into... Uh, really I urge you to reject the amendment and devote the funding that the Community Preservation Act gave its consideration to and also agreed was valuable and worthy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Dre and then Mr. Christopher Moore. Good evening, Elizabeth Dre, Precinct 10. I don't know much about history. And it sounds like there's actually a lack of clarity about the history that happened at this location. So a previous speaker said, we can't move history. And yet we've also heard that it didn't actually happen there. It happened at the intersection of Paul Revere and Appleton. So, I'm unclear about whether this is the actual place that needs to be commemorated or whether we are forcing this at a cost of $450,000 plus an anticipated $50,000 next year from the Department of Public Works, which Mr. Tosti spoke about. When I attended earlier meetings about this, there was talk about taking advantage of the tourist industry that went from Boston and bypassed Arlington and trying to get tour buses to stop and how that was gonna benefit local businesses. But I wonder about that, right? What are the local businesses there? We have a Dunkin' Donuts. Has anyone talked to the other local businesses that are there, how they feel about tour buses pulling up in front of their spas? I know there's a Sedona spa. I know there's a hair cutting place. How do they feel about this? Are we taking parking away from their businesses to now have bus parking? Is a bus going to be sitting there and idling while people get out and take a picture? Right? To me, it's not the best use of our money. And I don't think it's the best use of that space. Um, I understand that there's going to be pedestrian crossing um, and some traffic calming is part of this. And I'm wondering if that's going to happen regardless of this funding by whether or not this um, we vote funding tonight or not. Do we have someone who can answer that question? Mr. Feeney. Jim Feeney, town manager. At present, that the pedestrian measures and traffic calming measures that are included as part of the Mass Ave and Appleton Corridor project would only happen if we receive MassWorks grant funding. Thank you. I'm sorry, can, can I ask a clarifying question? Is that related to this $450,000 that we're voting on tonight? Not necessarily, no. Okay, so we can vote against this money and still perhaps do the traffic calming and pedestrian crosswalks there? If we receive a separate pot of money, yes. Thank you, appreciate that. Okay, so that which is desperately needed is a very busy intersection. It is not safe for pedestrians. That's what we need. We need pedestrian crosswalks and we need traffic calming and that is not related to what we have in front of us tonight. I also took a look at the picture and right now it's very grassy there in that little corner. And it looks like in the, in the models that that's gonna be turned to pavement. And I wonder, 
Is that the right thing for this little space? I love the idea of a water fountain, and I would love to have that be there regardless, but I don't think that's a reason to do this. And if we look at the money that's outstanding, $1.2 million minus $450,000 still has a bill of $750,000. Uh, there was idea of 200 plus 50 plus 25, 50 of that, again, coming from the Department of Public Works. So there's still 475,000 outstanding. So I'm wondering, is there any guarantee that if this does not get funded, that the CPA will not come back to town meeting again in the future to ask for more money for this project, should this pass tonight? Well, I don't think we can speculate what might happen in future town meetings. Well, I'm asking what the CPA can commit to us for the future, for asking us for more money or not about for this particular project. Well, the membership can change in the future, right? Okay, yeah. all right. All right, thank you. I um, encourage you to vote for the Pretzer Amendment. Thank you. Okay, we'll take Ms., uh, Mr. Christopher Moore next and then Mr. Stephen Moore. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Christopher Moore, Precinct 14, motion to terminate debate. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate and a second. All those in favor of terminating debate uh, on Article 50 and all matters under it, uh, say yes. Yes. All those opposed, say no. no. Debate is terminated. So we'll first take a vote on the Pretzer Amendment, which seeks to strike item M from the projects. And item M is uh, the uh, foot of the rocks that we've been discussing in detail. So if you're in favor of uh, striking uh, item M, the foot of the rocks project from, uh, from the, the projects, uh, press one for yes. Press two for no to leave it in the list of projects, or three to abstain. This is the Pretzer Amendment that we're voting on. Okay, let's close voting. And this is a majority vote. And the motion fails. 77 in the affirmative, 95 in the negative, and six abstentions. So the main motion is uh, remains the recommended vote of the Community Preservation Act Committee. So we'll now take a vote on the main motion, which is not amended. Okay, this is a vote now on the main motion. If you're in favor of the CPA projects as recommended in the Community Preservation Act Committee report, uh, press one for yes. If you're opposed to these projects and the funding, press two for no, uh, and three to abstain. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion passes, 160 in the affirmative, 15 in the negative, three abstentions. And that takes us to Article 53. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. That's Steve DeCourcy, Chair of the Select Board. Uh, through Article 53, the Select Board is seeking town meetings authorization to acquire land parcels or rights in lands to secure a public right of way in and around the Stratton School for the purposes of placing sidewalks. This is for pedestrian safety. It's related to the Safe Routes to School infrastructure or in Safe Routes to School program. I'd like to turn the presentation over to our senior transportation planner, John Alessi. After the presentation, in his capacity as a town meeting member, Mr. Diggins will be offering an amendment which inserts language that the Mass DOT has asked be, to be inserted for further clarification that came up after our vote, and that's why we didn't vote for, for that as a select board. Mr. Lessing. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. DeCourcy, and thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is John Alessi. I'm the Senior Transportation Planner in the Department of Planning and Community Development. And I'm before you this evening to talk about the Stratton Safe Routes to School project in Warrant Article 53. Next slide. So to summarize this Warrant Article, it is the C of Town Meeting will authorize the Select Board to approve the Stratton Safe Routes to School project's right-of-way acquisition plan. Next slide. 
So the purpose of this project is to provide a fully accessible walking route with safe roadway crossings for children and others to walk to the Stratton School. This is um, based on a grant that the town received in 2019 from the MassDOT Safe Routes to School Infrastructure Grant Program. And after this project is fully constructed and designed, the town will have received over $2.1 million in funding provided by the agency. And I'll note that the right-of-way acquisition is the town's only financial responsibility for the project. Next slide. So to give some background on the project's scope, this project is taking place mainly on Hemlock Street and Dixon Ave, with improvements on Mountain Ave and Wheeler Lane as well. And the components include new and repaired sidewalks, newer upgraded curb ramps, new curb extensions, and new rectangular rapid flashing beacons at um, new crosswalks. Next slide. So to give some history on the project, um, like I said, this was a grant received in 2019 through the MassDOT Safe Routes to School program. Um, and since then, we've had three um, abutter meetings in order to develop the design at its current state. So we had an in-person project information session in June 2019, a virtual public meeting on the conceptual design in November 2021, and a virtual 25% design public hearing in January 2023. And I'll note that for all of these meetings, notification letters were sent to the abutters, and um, there's an example of that to the right, but you can't read that. Next slide. So the current status of the project, we're currently at the 75% design stage for the construction and right-of-way plans, meaning that the design can change as it progresses to the 100% design. And I'll note that the affected property owners have not been alerted yet because the right-of-way plans need to be finalized before sending out notification letters with the exact impacts of the project. And currently the town is waiting on MassDOT to provide the final design plan so the town can start the right-of-way acquisition process, well, which I'll speak about in a moment. Uh, next slide. So MassDOT's right-of-way bureau um, requires a town meeting vote to take or otherwise acquire by eminent domain, purchase, donation, or other means land in and around the project. So Warrant Article 53 is requesting that town meeting authorize the select board to approve the right-of-way acquisition plan for two reasons. One, the acquisition needs to be approved well before the planned construction, which is slated for summer 2025, and waiting until the spring 2025 town meeting might put the project schedule at risk. And MassDOT's right-of-way bureau also permits town meeting to authorize the select board to approve the right-of-way acquisition plan sooner to ensure that the project stays on schedule, which can take place in winter 2025. Next slide. So I have a little image of the currently known um, impacts to the project, and I wanted to give kind of a summary of what those types of impacts are gonna be at this stage of the 75% design, knowing that they can change as we progress to the 100%. So there are 42 affected properties at this stage of the design. When I say affected properties, I mean the number of properties with um, fee takings and or easements. Um, and I'll note that an affected property might have more than one type of impact. So the three values you see to the right um, are not gonna add up to 42 necessarily. There are three fee takings for the project. And when I say fee takings, I mean there's going to be a complete transfer of ownership rights to another entity, that being the town. And I will note that the number of fee takings is relatively small compared to the other types of takings, um, two of which are only affecting private ways, and then there's one final one, the third, that will be a total of 18 square feet on an individual property at this point in the design. There are also five permanent easements, which means ownership remains with the landowner, and another entity may use the land permanently. So in this case, the project mainly has permanent easements for utility poles so that um, workers can access that infrastructure. And the majority of the um, taking um, impacts are temporary easements, there are 42 of them. And this means that the ownership remains with the landowner, but another entity may use the land temporarily. And in this case, this is going to be the um, construction workers who are constructing the project, stepping on the one's property. Next slide. So if town meeting were to um, approve warrant article 53 tonight, here are the next steps of what um, the town will do for this project in the right of way acquisition process. So we're gonna work with MassDOT to finalize the construction right of way plans, um, hopefully having those completed by fall 2024 so we know the exact impacts. 
At that point, we'll notify all affected property owners on record, send letters of intent, and offer individual site meetings with the property owners, again happening in fall 2024. We would then hire an independent appraiser to value the impacts to the affected properties, which would take place in the fall and into the winter of 2025. We would then present the final right-of-way acquisition plan to the select board and request a vote of approval in winter of 2025. We would then offer just compensation to property owners in the winter and spring, and then we would hopefully start construction in summer 2025. Next slide. So to summarize again, warrant article 53 is to see if town meeting will authorize the select board to approve the Stratton Safe Route to School Project's right-of-way acquisition plan. So I thank you for your time this evening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you. Let's um, uh, bring up Mr. Diggins to offer his amendment. And do we have this to present? We do. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Leonard Diggins, Precinct 3. So I'd like to make a motion to amend the vote language to add the following 12 words after the, um, the phrase public right of way. Those 12 words are including as needed by acquisition of permanent easements, temporary easements, and fee takings. Okay, we have a motion in front. Can we zoom this in on the... Uh, and we have a second. It is now for us. Did you want to speak to it, Mr. Dickens? Actually, I'll ask Mr. Cunningham if it's still okay to speak to this. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Michael Cunningham, Town Council. Um, and thanks for making this amendment, Mr. Diggins. This was made at the request of the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. Uh, they reviewed our, our language and, and, and just a be, kind of a belts and suspenders approach. I think that the legal terms are covered in the last sentence of the, uh, the original vote language, but this just further enhances that language. So it was made at the request of the Department of Transportation, who's obviously administering this project and, and working with them is important. Thank you. Thank you. Let's switch over to the speaker queue. Um, apologies for not doing that earlier. And let's clear the speaker queue because uh, this might be stale. Um, okay, so the speaker queue is now open. Uh, are we clearing it multiple times? Okay, hopefully that's the last time. Uh, we'll take Mr. Goldsmith and then Ms. Antzak. Hi there, Gary Goldsmith, Precinct 11. Uh, I have uh, walked this, uh, <clears throat> this access, uh, the access needed for the sidewalk um, and uh, had uh, decided not to do a presentation of this in the vain hopes that we might finish tonight, but apparently not. Um, in any case, uh, one thing that I noted, uh, aside from the fact that there are no sidewalks, um, is that there are quite a number of uh, very large street trees ranging from a diameter of a foot and a half to two feet in diameter. Some are quite impressive. Um, and I was wondering, I guess this is a question for the, uh, uh, for, I'm not sure if this is a question for, I guess for the presenter. Um, are those street trees likely to be removed or built around or what happens to those? Thank you very much. Um. Does anyone have an answer, to that, Mr. Lessie? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Alessi, Senior Transportation Planner. So, like I mentioned before, we're at the 75% design right now, so we might things might change as we advance to the final design. Right now, the project um, includes the removal of 10 trees, um, planting 14 trees, and removing and replace, replanting two trees. I would point out that uh, uh, although it is a wonderful thing to uh, plant new trees, <clears throat> excuse me, to plant new trees, and that often is raised as a, uh, uh, as a reason to remove other trees because we're planting new trees there, but the difference between removing a, uh, an 18 inch diameter, two foot diameter tree with a uh, uh, three, four inch, maybe probably not five inches, uh, tree, which it's true that in, in uh, 50 to 70 years might actually reach 18 inches, um, is not perhaps in the best interests of uh, uh, our climate or our town. Thank you very much. Okay, let's take Ms. Ansack, and then um, let's see, we'll skip down to Mr. Foskett, who hasn't spoken in a while. 
Thank you, uh, Amy Antzak, Precinct 17. Just very briefly, I urge everyone to support this warrant article. I am a Stratton parent. I walk this exact route to school almost every day with my children. We walk up Hemlock and turn onto Dixon. There are no sidewalks for most of my walk, and the children are forced to walk in the street, frequently in the middle of the street when there are cars parked, parked along the side. And I can tell you that cars drive very fast, despite being in a residential neighborhood right near a school. I've witnessed many near misses of children almost getting hit when people go extremely fast up Hemlock, which is a very uh, steep hill, and there's a sharp turn onto Dixon. And when you uh, have to walk in the middle of the road at that sharp turn, sometimes um, it gets, it's a close call sometimes. So anyway, I certainly don't want to see any large trees cut down. Hopefully the design can incorporate that. But for the sake of some of our youngest pedestrians, I do urge you to vote yes. And um, hopefully we can move forward with this very important Safe Routes to School program. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Foskett, and then we'll skip down further to Mr. Solomon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Charles Foskett, uh, Precinct 10. Um, <clears throat> was the slide uh, show presented tonight on the Nova's agenda? Excuse me? Was the slide show that was presented tonight on the town meeting agenda? Site? Yeah, like on the, in the annotated warrant or? Yeah. I don't know, Ms. Brazil, was it listed in the end? We don't recall, if it, like, not, not all the presentations are uh, listed there. We, we list them there if the presenters ask them to be. So the first point I would make is I think we're putting the cart before the horse here. Uh, I want to say that I'm 100% in favor of safe streets and safety for our children and, and their parents. And I am strongly in favor of children walking to school. However, from my perspective, we don't have any details of what's going on. We saw a slide projection projector uh, show that it, Personally, two seats in there, I couldn't see the details. I don't know how many houses are involved. I don't know who the, who the houses are, what's going to be done, whether the land's going to be taken, whether there's going to be an easement. Uh, there just is not the information for town meeting to act on this. And we're talking about something very serious here. We're talking about taking people's land. First, so, so they have a, people have a right to know what's going to happen to their land before t and, and be able to discuss this at town meeting before town meeting in advance gives the select board the right to, to, to proceed on a, on a project like this and take, and take their land. And the most important thing is with these easements and with these takings, there has to be a fair market value transfer to the owners of the land. We don't know what those costs are. And we shouldn't be voting and giving the select board the power to do this if they don't come to us first with the number of properties, what's going to happen, and how much is it going to cost. And I think all of those things could be ascertained ahead of time before we vote this article to transfer this power to the select board. So I would strongly urge that the select board, the town management, the traffic department proceed with their plans. I think it's very important. But I also think it's very important the town meeting not vote to empower the select board to proceed to take any property unless we know what the impact is. Thank you. Okay, let's take Mr. Solomon next, and then we'll skip down to... Uh, no. uh, it would be in order. Okay, we have a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? second. All those, um, let's see, do we have any notices of reconsideration tonight? Ms. Deschler? Uh, Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. I give a notice of reconsideration for Articles 35, 36, 42, 48, and 49. Okay. Okay, so we have a motion to adjourn in front of us. All those in favor of adjourning until Monday at 8 p.m., say yes. Yes. All those opposed, say no. No. Let's go to an electronic vote.
Okay, green light is on. If you're in favor of adjourning, press one for yes. If you want to continue debating, uh, press two for no. We're three to abstain. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion fails, 71 in the affirmative, 99 in the negative. We are not adjourned. Okay, so I believe next we're gonna take Mr. Solomon. Yeah, and Can then, you hear me? Okay. what's that? Joe Solomon, Precinct 16, motion to terminate debate and all matters okay. before us. Okay. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate on Article 50, 53 and all matters before it. All those in favor of terminating debate on Article 53 say yes. Yes. All those opposed say no. No. Debate is terminated. So we will first take a vote on the Diggins Amendment, which adds um, the text, including as needed by acquisition of permanent easements, temporary easements, temporary uh, and, and fee takings. Um, so if you're in favor of the insertion of that text in the main motion, you would vote one for yes, and voting is now open. If you're opposed to that amendment to the main motion, press two for no, or three to abstain. And this amendment is a, as all amendments are uh, to a main motion, is a majority vote. Okay, let's close voting. And the Diggins Amendment passes. 164 in the affirmative, seven in the negative, three abstentions. That brings us to a vote on the main motion as amended by the Diggins Amendment. And so once voting opens, it's not open yet, and this is a two-thirds vote uh, to authorize the select board to acquire land parcels. Voting is now open. It's a vote to authorize the select board to acquire land parcels and or rights in land parcels to obtain and secure a public right of way in and around the Stratton Elementary School um, with the addition of the Diggins Amendment. If you're in favor of that, press one for yes. If you're opposed, press two for no, or three to abstain. Okay, it's, voting is closed. And uh, it is an affirmative vote. Uh, it is a two-thirds vote. 135 in the affirmative, 35 in the negative, and three abstentions. Okay, we have a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? All those in favor of adjourning say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. no. We are adjourned until Monday at 8 p.m. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.